Good morning, everybody. Uh, general, um, generals, uh, director, dean, ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished guests from Ukraine, uh, welcome to this conference. Um, and a special warm welcome for uh, our guest from Kyiv that came from uh, 20 degrees plus to uh, snow in Oslo. This year's conference is titled um, uh, Building Resilience, the Russia-Ukraine War and Security Challenge for Ukraine and Europe. And we chose this title because Russia's war does challenge um, the core and every core of European security. And we need to understand that this war uh, is, is, is such a challenge and we need to ha ha create and establish good knowledge of it in order to support Ukraine in a good way. And um, uh, this is also necessary for us to prepare for the more uncertain future that we are facing. And this war might end for some uh, at some time. It might last for a long time that we that's what we we think uh, and um, the security situation in Europe will still be challenging post-war we will still face uh, hostile Russia by all accounts so building resilience and learn from the Ukrainian experience will make us more able if we adapt accordingly. I'll stop there on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, the frame of the conference. We have uh, good opening remarks and uh, so forth. A couple of uh, practical points. Uh, emergency exits are this one and the one in the back. Um, toilets are through that door um, and um, we have a digital audience please uh, bear that in mind uh, welcome to you as well and we also have simultaneous uh, translation and please when you speak be clear uh, so they can do their job accordingly now I'm honored to uh, present the opening speaker, uh, the chief of the Norwegian Defense, Erik Christoffersen. Please, the floor is yours. So thank you, and, uh, and it's an honor to host you here in Oslo. Uh, thank you for coming all the way from Ukraine in these very hard times, and that you also look into the future when it comes to cooperation between our universities. Uh, but also the conference about building resilience is very important for, for Norway in these times as well, because it's our neighbor that has attacked you. You know, we are the neighbor to Russia, and they, and, uh, and they have attacked uh, another neighbor, Ukraine. Um, when we discuss about our support to Ukraine, I'll always remind people in Norway that before 24th of February last year, it was three brigades on the Russian-Finnish border. It was two brigades, Russian brigades on the Kola Peninsula. It was one Russian brigade outside Finland. At this time, they are down to company-sized units, three, four, maybe one battalion altogether. So three brigades reduced the battalion-sized unit dispersed on three places. It shows the losses Russia are taking in Ukraine thanks to, to the fight the Ukrainians are putting up. 
So, it, so the situation in Ukraine affects us directly uh, in the short term, in the mid term and in the long term. So what I wanted to talk about in this opening is, is uh, the importance of learning. But I will also talk about how do we support Ukraine. I have to admit I've been flying with one of those planes a number of times back from Afghanistan, but that was a different war. We're talking about uh, the war in Ukraine now. Um, so what do we do in Norway? How do we support Ukraine? How do I look at this support uh, for the next years? First of all, it's, it's a, one of my, the highest priority missions we are doing is to support Ukraine. For the armed forces in Norway, it's a big operation. Uh, sometimes I hear people that saying that you know we have a lot to do now, but I always remind them that uh, Valery Salushny has a lot more to do. So it's you know there is no no need to to think that we have a lot to do. There is a lot to do in Ukraine, but we need to support Ukraine. And we have we decided to call operation to support Ukraine, Operation Elisiv. Elisiv, uh, as you all know, was a Ukrainian princess who married a Norwegian king back in the Viking time. Uh, there is a statue of Elisiv in, in Kiev, in one of the ch churches I went to see, the, see that statue in March. But the support to Ukraine, Operation Elisiv, goes a long way back. You know, the relationship between Norway and Ukraine has been there for decades and, and for hundreds of years. I need to focus on that. But we call Operation Elisiv uh, over support to Ukraine. And we decided to do it alo first along uh, four lines of operation. The first line was what we would call military training and support. We will continue, and we have, we have trained Ukrainian soldiers. We have trained Ukrainian soldiers in Norway. We have trained Ukrainian soldiers in Lithuania, in Poland, in the uh, UK, in Germany. And we will continue to support Ukraine with training. And uh, for, for the Norwegian soldiers, who has, and they have been deployed to Afghanistan, Iraq, different places. They say that this is the most meaningful mission they have ever had, is the training. So friendships are being established, bonds have been created, and we see that from our training of Ukrainian soldiers, we also learn a lot uh, on the backside. When, when they are deployed to Ukraine, they keep those lines of communications open, and they, they, they give us feedback on the training and how it worked in real-time war. The second thing we are doing is the donations from our own military uh, equipment. So donations also means uh, training, because we need to train Ukrainians on our donations. And we'll continue to donate material from our own stocks, um, and we'll do that for, for the next years. Um, in the beginning, we talked about donations for the short term, you know, to stop the Russian uh, from invading Ukraine. Now we are talking about donations on the short term still, because the war is still going on. But also for the mid and long term. For the mid, mid term, to start the transition from Soviet era material in Ukraine to more modern NATO um, Western standard material um, that Ukraine makes, makes it easier for us also to support Ukraine in the, in the mid term. For the long term, it's about the transition. It's the transition uh, for Ukraine, it's the transition in NATO as well, to be more standardized, to be more interoperable, to have, make sure that we have the same sort of equipment across the alliance, at least equipment that we can, <coughs> that, that we can um, work together with. And donations um, will continue, and it's always a discussion, how long should you get on donations? How, how long should you get on your own stocks? Um, that's why we also look at donations and acquisition from industry. And that's one of the big challenges we have right now, is the industry's ability to step up production. And we are working on that. We need, we need to produce more artillery ammunition. We need to produce more um, main battle tanks. We need to produce more to fill up also our own stocks, but also to support Ukraine. Uh, so industry's ability to, to deliver is something that is been being continuously discussed. But working with industry also means that we are working together uh, in support of Ukraine from the military side as well. When industry delivers equipment, we work close with them to make sure that we have the 
that the Ukrainians learn how to use this equipment that is been being donated from industry. The fourth line that I put up in the beginning was, you know, we need to refill our stocks, both to have material in Norway. Uh, we don't know what, what Russia will look like after the war. They are still a threat to us. We need to make sure that we have enough uh, missiles, enough artillery pieces, enough ammunition in our stocks. Um, but it's a win-win. If we, if we need to donate it to Ukraine, okay, we will take the risk, but then you also Im increase the production from, from industry. So this four lines operation was what we started out with in uh, February, March last year. So what has happened since then? What did we learn? We learned a lot from the war in Ukraine. There are so many lessons learned and you're going to discuss them today, building resilience. So what can we now learn from this war? Because in the beginning, we thought we, our thinking was that we, you know, we need to learn the Ukrainians how to use this equipment. No, they are learning us how they have been using it, the real wartime experiences. So we added a fifth line this summer about lessons learned. There are so many lessons learned from Ukraine that we need to take into our way of thinking. First of all, you have the lessons learned from how the Russians are doing their operations. Because we have seen it now. We have seen their, the lack of, um, of uh, leadership. We have seen the lack of um, morale. We have seen a lot of problems in the Russian forces. And we also seen how they use their equipment and, and um, how they don't use it. So we are, we are learning a, ro a lot from what the Russians are doing based on how they try to fight this war. Luckily, they are not succeeding, but that's also thanks to Ukraine. And that's the other side. We are learning so much from Ukraine about how you are fighting this war about how you are changing your systems, how you have been able to make all these different pieces of equipment that we donated to Ukraine, and you made it work, to, made it work together. You made it interoperable, as we say. You, know, you, you actually solved a lot of problems that we still have in NATO, because you are the result. Our donations are the result of a NATO that sometime went away from standardization. And then you have to deal with all these things. And now we can learn a lot from that. And then you have all the lessons learned about the total uh, defense system, about the whole of society ap uh, approach to this, and about the leadership. So there is one, there's, there's one thing that I, I really want us to invest in, is how did the leadership in Ukraine manage to stand up against a numerical superior enemy and uh, stop them and then starting to retake uh, the occupied territory, piece by piece. And that's not only about equipment, it's not only about the number of soldiers, it's a lot about leadership. And how does this, and how did you, the Ukraine, Ukrainian officers and, and political leadership, how did you manage to send out these clear messages across all these nations that wants to support you, more than 50. And, and it's so consistent. You know, we know exactly what you need, because you're talking exactly the same language. If I meet a Ukrainian in Washington DC, or uh, as I met in Kyiv, or here in Oslo, it's always the same message to me, which is very important, because it makes it very clear, easy for me to go back to my political leadership and talk about what Ukraine really needs. So again, thank you for being here. We will continue to support Ukraine. Uh, we have a five-year plan, that's Operation Elisiv. That's been decided by all parties in Parliament, they're all behind it. It gives me flexibility to plan for the future, and we'll support Ukraine in the short, in the mid, and in the long term. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, uh, General, and uh, Operation Elisib, that's an excellent name. Um, now we have uh, Brigadier uh, Anatoly Pavlikovsky. He's uh, head of the uh, Center for Military and uh, Strategic Studies at the National Defense University of Ukraine. Please, the floor is yours. Uh. 
панове генералы, офицеры, шановные присутни. Dear generals, officers, dear guests. И я бригадный генерал Анатолий Павликовский Том презентет. Uh, as uh, Tom has already presented me, introduced me, I am the Brigadier Anatoly Pavlikovsky. But really it was supposed that uh, from the Ukrainian side they uh, should go uh, to present Ukrainian delegation, the uh, Colonel General Mikhailo Koval. Але на жаль з поважних причин він не зміг бути сьогодні тут, тому дозвольте від його імені оголосити його звернення до сьогоднішніх членів конференції. But uh, because uh, of uh, certain <coughs> reasons, he was unable to uh, come here today. So uh, let me please uh, uh, read his address to you on behalf of him. Вітаю усіх учасників конференції. Шкодую, що не зміг сьогодні бути серед вас, колі друзів, партнерів і однодумців України. I'd like to say the welcome words to all the participants of the conference. Unfortunately, I was unable to be today here with you in the circle of our uh, friends and the partners of Ukraine. Сьогоднішній захід, конференція побудови стійкості російсько-українська війна та виклики безпеці України та Європі надзвичайно актуальний і важливий. The today's event, the conference, <coughs> Building Resilience, the Russian-Ukrainian War and security challenges to Ukraine and Europe is extremely topical and significant. Наша мета – це вироблення нових підходів, які дозволять убезпечити наш світ від існуючих загроз та нових дестабілізацій. Мир – це глобальна цінність. Our goal is to elaborate the new approaches that will help us to make the world secure from the security threats. So the peace that is the global value. Дякую Норвегії та її народу за всебічну допомогу. I'd like to express the gratitude to Norway and its people the for the comprehensive assistance. За надані спорядження, зброю та озброєння. For all the military equipment, vehicles and weaponry that was given to us. Синє небо України ефективно захищає зенітно-ракетний комплекс норвезького виробництва НАСАМС. The blue sky of Ukraine is uh, being effectively protected by the multiple missile launcher NASAMS produced by Norway. Підготовлені Норвегією бійці боронять Україну в складі сил оборони. And uh, the Ukrainian warriors that were trained by Norway, they defend Ukraine uh, as the participants of the defense forces. А нещодавно уряд дружньої Норвегії прийняв дуже важливе рішення про передачу Україні бойових літаків F-16. And recently the government of Norway has made the important decision to render the combat aircrafts F-16 to Ukraine. Бажаю цікавої, взаємовигодної та продуктивної роботи. I wish you the uh, mutually beneficial, uh, extremely interesting and uh, productive cooperation. Миру після нашої перемоги. And I wish uh, everyone peace after our victory. Слава Україні, слава Норвегії, слава нашим героям оборонцям. Glory to Ukraine, glory to Norway, and glory to our heroes, our defenders. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anatoly. Um, next, we have uh, the keynote uh, speakers. We have... Uh, been fortunate to have uh, two uh, excellent Ukrainian uh, scholars and uh, uh, well-used uh, speeches on, on, on the war. Uh, we have, uh, please, if you can uh, come up, uh, uh, Alina Frolova. Uh, she's the deputy chair of uh, the, uh, the Center for Defense Strategies. 
she's also previously a defense deputy defense minister uh, in Ukraine in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we have, uh, in addition, Yevgenia Galber, digitally. She unfortunately came in with COVID, but uh, she's with us on the screen. Uh, Yevgenia, she's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and she uh, has been an advisor to the Prime Minister, a foreign policy advisor to the Prime Minister in Ukraine. So, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um. Well, uh, it's always difficult to make a keynote speaking because uh, everyone expects something like a quite a big <laughs> and you have al al already a limited time, but I will try. We try to split with Evgenia our address so um, not to overcome each other. But um, first of all, I like, Tom, um, your um, optimism when you're saying about the post-war settlement and I think that this is something which we really need to everyone to look at the distance not to look only at the war which is coming now and this is what we lack from many people and I hope that um, uh, the, the people from academia will bring this to policy papers that we need to plan our future and we need to plan our future in a strategic way. Um, uh, you also mentioned the exits and I thought that in Ukraine we have now a different reality. We're not speaking about exits, we're speaking about shelters. So each time you're like, uh, having some kind of gathering of people, you're always saying about the shelter, how long it takes, you show the way. And you know, most of the conferences now are done in, sometimes in shelter, like uh, not to waste the time for going up and uh, down. And uh, I also would like to address uh, one word about the, what the chat said. And thank you for your support. Uh, extreme, extremely, we know that um, Norwegi uh, Norwegian people are supporting us and we know that Norwegian armed forces are supporting us. And we really rediscover now our history because we were under the great pressure of the Soviet propaganda when we uh, thought many of us really believed in it that Russia is our brother nation. But if we uh, come back to our roots, we know that our uh, like uh, roots are from uh, the Nordic nations. And uh, Ukraine actually was established as a mixture of the Roman and Nordic uh, um, nations. And this is, I think, something which we need to rediscover both. And this is could be a platform for, for future cooperation of us. So, um, Russian war and implications on Europe's security structure. Um, it's a very wide topic, uh, but um, what we already discussed yesterday on some like uh, smaller meetings and what I try to deliver in all my speeches now, that the war which we're facing now, this is not only the war in Ukraine. And uh, this is a war which already like uh, changed a lot, established world order. And uh, this is how we should evaluate this war. We shouldn't evaluate it from the position of how Ukraine and Russia are fighting each other on the battlefield, but we should evaluate it from the uh, position of how this war influenced our life. We dealing now in Ukraine with global conflict, uh, which already actually influenced the life of billions of people, not only in Europe, it's in Africa, in Asia and all over the world. We actually declared that um, um, Ukraine is fighting for its uh, freedom, for Ukraine is fighting for European values, and Ukraine is fighting for democracy here. But uh, Russia has declared also their goals, and their goal is to fight with NATO. I mean, they percept this war as fi a fight with NATO, fight with America, and fight with democracy. So, from both sides who are on active combat, the goals are clear. We are fighting for democracy, they are fighting against it. And um, so the Putin has this, like, uh, you know, very uh, big obsession about Ukraine. Uh, because, again, of historical roots, because he wants to occupy our history, but actually, in the beginning, it looks like everything is towards Ukraine, that all these atrocities, all these um, actions which are done, they like a terror only against Ukrainians. Uh, but if we look at his 
like a tactics, we will see that this is actually uh, quite a practical and um, uh, practical goals which he declared and which he follows. And these goals are, and these rationals are, to redefine the norms and establish new global reality. Uh, the, the Russians has this like approach of setting the cows, and we've discussed yesterday why they have it. Uh, but they actually follow this path. And this is some kind of freak logic, which is difficult to understand for many people in Europe, but this is their logic. And um, the reality is that uh, our world lacks, lacks now uh, the enforcement tools to bring the reality to normal. And our uh, uh, world is lacking, let's say, leadership in bringing reality to normal. And this is not about the leadership of United States or some country, but this is about the leadership of each country who should identify their goals in this war and should follow like, uh, the path to these goals. Um, for, for me, it's clear that this is the fight between two civilizations. And yes, uh, Ukrainians do not percept Russian as a civilized nation, but this is civilization with all the, like, a, I don't know, signs of civilization, all the attributes of civilization. This civilization is quite ugly, it's quite rough, but this is still is with their declared values, with their de declared approach. Uh, and this is, but this is really a fight between two civilizations of autocracy and democracy. And war between civilization always um, question the basics, always question the values. So this is the war uh, which, like, uh, for us, as for European civilization, and Ukraine is obviously already proved to, uh, its right to be a part of the democratic world, is the war for uh, existence. Uh, because the world is big, uh, we live in civilization which we build, which we want to, to continue to live, uh, but someone attacks us. Uh, and if we look at this war from like uh, this perspective, um, we should understand that the target of this war should be to win this war. But let's say this goal is not clear yet for European countries. No, other, no any country in Europe, in the United States, said that our goal in this war is to win it, but everyone declared that we will stay with Ukraine as long as possible. We don't want this to be a goal, because this goal is not smart. Every one of us was like a passing strategic courses. We know that all the goals should be smart as long as possible. What is this? When it is? How, it, how we will reach the goal if the goal is not clear? So this is about the identification of the goal. Ceasefire or frozen conflict, how does it um, impact on the achieving this goal? If we say that the goal is winning, ceasefire is step to win? No. Freezing the conflict is step to win? No. Freezing of conflict is the uh, step which will allow Russia to uh, rejuvenate their forces to make the lessons learned, and Russians are making the lessons learned. We can just like uh, make a laugh of them, we can make a lot of humor, but they still make uh, a, very less, a lot of lessons learned. They, uh, they are good in electronic warfare, they are good in producing very cheap UAVs, they are good in mobilizing the people on different uh, principles with different uh, motivation, but they are big. And if we want to win this war, we just need to identify the goal and identify the path to the goal. And if we will look at this war from the perspective of winning, uh, then you will understand that it's not crucially important how successful is current currently counteroffensive or how successful would be next one, because this is about the final achievement, and we need to keep this goal in our uh, focus all the time. Hamas attack demonstrates that the absence of failure uh, of Putin like, uh, supports the aggressors all over the world. Uh, this is actually the well-coordinated actions. You know that Hamas is strategic partner of Russia and they openly say that the Russia is our strategic partner. Uh, just like a 
strategies, military strategies, think about whether Hamas had any chance to win the war which they have started. No, they didn't, because the forces are quite uh, like unequal. But why they started? Why they did it? They obviously provoke Israel and their ally uh, allies to enter into some actions which will destabilize the world even in more scale than Russian-Ukrainian war. And this is the target. The target is not to kill 1,000 of mm. Israeli. The, the target is not to catch up some territory. The target is even not to bring the, I don't know, statehood to Palestinian. The target is provoke democratic nations to get into another conflict, more serious, more scaled, and to spread the attention, to spread the forces, and to become weaker. This is the target, and this is for them successful target as for now, because we didn't stop it with Putin, we didn't create the precedent with Putin, we didn't punish the power which was like a quite aggressive and violated all rules, we have the next conflict, and unfortunately, I don't think that this is the last one within the years to come. So, what this chaotic approach brought to you, if we speaking about the threats to European security. I tried to be some kind of logical, and of course I split it in some like uh, subdivisions. So first of all, of course, this is physical threat. And I know that many NATO nations are skeptical about whether Russia can attack NATO. Um, uh, Lithuanians with whom we spoke like um, many years, you know, that they said that we've been always considered as paranoid in NATO. And now we have two of us, you and us. We're still not in the NATO, but we're both paranoid. And uh, uh, Baltic nations and Poland and Ukraine are absolutely sure that Russia, if they won't be stopped, they will attack the NATO territory. That's some kind of inevitable, we don't want to acknowledge this, but this is truth. No one was ready to acknowledge in Ukraine that the full-scale invasion is coming, although we saw all the marks, all the signs of this situation approaching. The same behavior we now observe with NATO politicians. All the signs of readiness to attack in case if they won't be stopped is here on the table, but we still do not acknowledge it. And for uh, Baltic nations, this is threat, vital threat to their existence. Uh, yeah, Polish nation is more prepared, but still we have like a huge threat to smaller nations, smaller political nations in Europe. Um, the second, this chaotic approach actually divides the societies. We see how unbalanced now is uh, European Union. We see the results of the last elections in many countries, including Switzerland, Switzerland, where the populists come to power. Uh, Switzerland, which always was like a, some kind of uh, country, uh, which uh, make a lot of very clever decisions through national referendum. So people has this like a direct democracy. They always projected some kind of reasonable uh, approach to this, and now they selected populism, elected populism. And I think that this is the direct impact of this like uh, multiple version of truth, which were possessed by Russia for many years in Europe. You cannot identify what is real. You cannot identify because all the time you have this like one truth, second truth, third truth, and uh, everything is not so like, uh, like you see. And I think that this destabilization of mental approach of many people in Europe bringing us now to the rising of populism. We see how Orban is comparing uh, EU to USSR, saying that this is type of dictatorship. We see how Erdogan is claiming war be be uh, between Christianity and Muslims. People, um, like politicians, bring no responsibility. And this all creates the destabilization inside the European Union. And if we speak about democracy, like <laughs> this is a very small piece of, of uh, earth on earth where democracy in European perception exists. We are like, a quite a small. And if we want to protect our style of life, our values, our approach, 
we need to think about it. And uh, what we see now, so this in addition, last days, Jew massacre, massacres attempts all over, including Russia. And I think that all medieval demons are already here. Unfortunately, I feel myself first in my life like being in medieval age. And I don't know where it co will come. I have some projections, but I don't like the idea of them. Um, the third point is destabilization of economy. And of course, now economy is suffering because of these uh, uh, limitations of gas supply from Russia, uh, because of many uh, markets and many links were disconnected. Uh, many links were broken, starting from logistics and transportation routes to like a traditional trade uh, uh, routes. So, but in this situation, many populistic politicians are saying that we need to stop to give assistance to Ukraine because it's too much. We just like take money from our national economies and bring them to war. But this is not true. And uh, should, should someone stop to assist Ukraine, uh, the economy will die uh, because of few reasons. Because the war will come on your territory, this is first. And the second, because you will miss an opportunity of development, the defense sector. Defense sector is boosting now. And from the uh, lessons learned from the first and the second world war, we know that after war, rejuvenation of economy is only thanks to the defense industry and uh, recovery industry, which is like a money in the economy, which bringing you to some kind of um, new good life. Uh, I already so said about the broken links, but we have now broken links and host of post-colonialism in Africa, Asia, and Middle East region, because this uh, Israeli war actually started to again divide the world on like a really on post-colonial approach, which we thought that we already overcome. And this is the question for European nations, first of all. Uh, the another lessons, or the another what it, uh, this war brought is understanding that you cannot overcome war or you cannot fight war of such a manner which we're facing now in Ukraine by yourself. No any nations on this planet, including I think that the United States cannot win the war like this, um, of this nature by itself. Because we have a lack of capabilities, we have a la lack of weapons, we have a lack of, uh, I don't know, the strategic approaches, which no any nation by itself can provide. So um, we need to, like uh, some kind to rethink the approach which we should re-establish, approach of common defense and common deterrence, which should be reinvented with the lessons learned, with the understanding of all the principles. Uh, and of course, industry capability and military capability challenge, which George already mentioned here, so I won't stop on it. So, um, sorry to tell you, but good old times are gone. And uh, this is reality. And if we want to face the new good times, we need to work over it. I mean that I don't see very like a, some kind of good uh, perspective for now. I see only bad and the most worst scenarios. But the issue is not about how we will feel at ourselves and where we will be in one year. The issue is where we will be in 10 years. And this is the perspective we need to keep. And uh, I think that um, the, as Clausewitz said, that every war has a political goal. I think that every military coalition must possess a political objective too. And we should establish this political objective and we should uh, like a, to have a shared vision of our victory. Victory, not support as long as it takes. And uh, regardless of whether it's short or prolonged or conventional or symmetric war, the imperative shall remain the same. The war must be won. And this is what I think is the main idea of this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Do we have uh, Evgenia with us? Please, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Evgenia. 
good morning. Can you hear me? Hopefully you can. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for the uh, invitation to join the conference. I would have loved to participate in person. Unfortunately, as Tom mentioned, because of COVID, I couldn't do that. But uh, in Ukraine for some time, uh, having COVID is in a way uh, going back to normality because I think that everyone forgot about COVID back in February 2022. So sometimes remembering there are some other challenges other than the war is also bringing you to normal uh, lifestyle. Uh, jokes apart, now we have uh, air raid uh, in uh, Odessa, including where I'm based. So in case you might hear some noise, just don't be afraid of that because I, I didn't want to go to shelter to be with you online. But we have now uh, ballistic missiles from uh, Crimea. And uh, this is another reason why Crimea has to be liberated and why there is no chance for, for us to stop this war without liberating Crimea. Because just yesterday, you might have heard of that, uh, Odessa region was attacked by uh, Onyx and we don't have uh, any possibility to um, somehow uh, deal with this uh, type of weapons still. So especially now in the south of Ukraine because of the seaport infrastructure, like yesterday, for example, uh, again, seaport infrastructure in, in the south of Ukraine was attacked. Uh, this is uh, one of the biggest challenges we're facing now, but uh, that's not how I wanted to start. That just I saw this uh, air raid alert and that made me uh, distract attention a bit to, to these different challenges. Um, in my remarks, uh, I want to focus on a couple of challenges that Ukraine has now in the long term perspective and then talk about um, what it means for Europe and what lessons. Uh, should be learned from uh, this uh, Russian war on uh, Ukraine. And finally, look at different options and scenarios and what implications uh, these might uh, have for um, European security and for the global security. So first, um, on the 615th day uh, of the full-scale um, invasion of Ukraine, uh, we are experiencing, uh, we are living through a very difficult time. And I'm not only talking about a recent article, I think yesterday's article by Simon Schuster in the actual time, uh, which talks about all the difficulties of keeping the struggle uh, of Zelensky's struggle to keep Ukraine in the fight. But I'm talking about this uh, so-called Ukraine fatigue. And the articles like this, unfortunately, I'm sure that we'll have much more of them. Uh, in the future. And unfortunately, I think that this is one of the uh, challenges we all have to face, uh, not only Ukraine, but also Ukrainian partners and allies in Europe. Uh, because the main question we should ask to ourselves is not when this war will end, because obviously no one of us knows a clear answer to that question, but rather how this war will end. And what happens if Ukraine does not uh, win this war? And this is a crucial uh, shift in mentality that we should have, I think. Uh, obviously, multiple challenges at the same time. Uh, we have new uh, electoral cycles in many uh, countries, which are Ukraine's uh, close allies in Europe and globally. We have elections in the United States, uh, in Slovakia, in Poland, with very different results for uh, Ukraine and for uh, European fight for democracy, and we have to be prepared for that. There will be another uh, electoral season in Europe this year, so the leadership of the countries and allies with which Ukraine is working now is different than the leadership that we started uh, this war when we were attacked by Russia. Uh, obviously, new conflicts uh, that uh, Alina has already mentioned that distract attention and that create these competing narratives and competing uh, 
uh, fight for uh, attention and for financial aid and for uh, arms supplies to, to the US and European allies. And this is exactly what Russia wants to see. Uh, lack of weapons uh, still, we can discuss this in detail, but uh, obviously Ukraine gets a lot, but this is uh, mainly too little and too late with very um, different implications on the uh, field, not becoming a game changer. So we still get what we need, but much later, meaning that the results uh, could have been and would have been uh, much better and much uh, faster had we got it in the, in the very beginning. But then there is also another challenge, which is uh, not very uh, often mentioned, and this is a demographic situation. And I think we have to uh, talk about this because uh, this is something that will define uh, decisions in the future as well. Uh, Ukrainian uh, population is uh, getting less and less, and we unfortunately also have losses on the battlefield, obviously. Russian losses are much bigger and we cannot compare them, but at the same time we cannot also compare the population of Russia, which is something like 1 million 30, uh, 135 million, whereas in Ukraine we have now something around 35, 33, 36, you have different figures, numbers, but much uh, less than in Russia. And again, uh, mobilization uh, capacities in Ukraine are uh, different from those in Russia. So we are fighting in a much more effective way, smarter way, more creative way, but we are fewer. So probably one of the questions to ask to ourselves, uh, and when I say us, I mean in Europe, is what happens if Ukraine loses? I don't say this is going to happen. I don't want to be pessimistic, but sometimes this is also sobering to ask ourselves a question, what happens if NATO actually has to be directly engaged with this uh, war of Russia just because, not because it's dragged or it escalates, uh, but because there are no Ukrainians to defend Europe from Russia. So probably it might be better to step up efforts to help Ukraine now rather than to wait until that moment. But this brings me to, uh, to my second uh, part of remarks uh, about lessons learned and about where are we now and what we should keep in mind while taking decisions. Um, and one of these uh, major points I want to make is that uh, we are uh, at this turning point, crucial point of war, uh, inflection point, as President Biden put it, uh, different names can apply, but uh, we have to switch uh, our mentality from three days operation, which never happened, to a war which will hopefully be if not short, then at least one year war, war uh, with, with ending that we can see on the horizon to a long war that Europe has to win. First to carry on and then to win. And this uh, shift in mentality to, to the long war, to in a way war of attrition, is crucial for us to be able to plan for the future and to build resilience in the long term, not in the short or mid term, but also in the long term. I remember workshops and discussions in the first uh, months or even in the first year of uh, the Russian aggression in Ukraine, and we were talking about different possibilities of this turning into a protracted conflict, into a war of attrition, and these were seen as one of the uh, least desirable scenarios. So when Ukrainians were pushing for more help, more aid, more weapon supplies, more production, that was exactly for the reason that uh, if this turns into the war of attrition, this will be much more beneficial for Russia rather than for Ukraine. Because Russia turned out to be much more resilient uh, to economic pressure, to sanctions, and much more flexible and adaptive in how it obtains weapons, how it uh, replenishes its ammunition, and how it gets more support from other illiberal uh, actors like China, Iran, North Korea. And this consolidation of access of illiberal actors is another challenge that Europe is now facing and will face in the future. So one of the... Um, lessons to be learned is that time matters and timing is really important because when we take the decisions which are expected and needed but when we take them too late then it will cost us twice as much at least 
uh, than if uh, they uh, were taken from the very beginning. Uh, my second point is that, um, and lessons learned for Ukraine and for the West, that we were not prepared for this war. Uh, Ukraine was not prepared for this full-scale invasion, let's not say war, because it started in 2014, not in uh, 2022, but also the West was not prepared for this war. Uh, there were no plans, um, no strategy, uh, no training, no planning for uh, this kind of scenario. So in a way, we failed to predict that. Until 2020, Russia was seen as a partner in NATO strategy. Now we have luckily a new strategy uh, of uh, NATO, a new strategic concept where Russia and terror organizations are seen as major threats. But uh, again, uh, now we need time because we have to follow up uh, after this vision and strategy, we have to follow up with uh, with plans, with developing uh, roadmaps, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we have to become much faster and much more radical in a way in our uh, decision making. And in this regard, uh, I was talking from the very beginning after a so-called Zeitenwende, which was uh, announced by uh, Chancellor Scholz, that uh, this is a declared site and wonder, but we need to have cognitive site and wonder or site and wonder 2.0. And I was making this point several times. So yesterday or the other day when I heard uh, Defense Minister Pistorius talking about how we have uh, now to move to this mentality change in politics and in society, that this is a long war and we have to be prepared for this and we have to be prepared for a real threat of war and Russian threat in Europe, not only in Ukraine. I was happy that finally we can hear this. But we hear this on the 615th day of the full-scale invasion in the center of Europe. And we cannot afford, uh, we don't have this luxury of taking such decisions and coming to these conclusions at the end of the second year of the full-scale invasion. So we do need this mentality change, and I still don't see it in many countries. Uh, in Nordic countries, in the Baltic countries, which are... Um, major partners of Ukraine, we can uh, feel this and we see this and we're grateful for this again, uh, especially uh, to, to Norway, to Sweden, to the, to the Baltic partners. But uh, it's important that we have this vision and that we promote this vision together with you in Europe generally, because I was talking the other day to the French, I was talking to Italians, and the question that I got was, there is no possibility we are switching to wartime economy, there is no possibility we can explain to our taxpayers why we have to be engaged more. So this realization that the threat, uh, Russian threat in Europe and for Europe will remain even if or when this full-scale invasion in Ukraine ends, this realization has to be uh, there. This has to be very clear. We have to be prepared with our total defense, with our resilience for long-term Russian threat. Depending on how this invasion of Ukraine ends, we will have higher level of this threat or lower level of this threat. We will have more time or less time to get prepared, but we will definitely have it there because Russia is not going to disappear one day. Now, uh, another lesson to be learned. NATO countries have to boost military production, sorry. and I'm also happy that uh, General Can you mentioned Can you it. Sorry, sorry. I do have to interrupt you. Deeply sorry. Uh, we have um, the schedule uh, that we have to follow. Uh, your uh, good points are uh, well noted, and I hope that you can come back to this in your uh introduction in the third panel so uh very good thoughts thank you um and uh, keep them uh hanging until uh the third panel thank you and we have uh <laughs> so uh now we have uh, our first uh panel A total war, armed forces, and civil resist, resi uh, resistance in Ukraine. And uh, the chair for that panel is a uh, colleague, um, Ingrid 
Uptal. She's head of the Center for Security Policy at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies. So please, uh, Ingrid, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's very good uh, to be present at this conference, and I'm looking forward to good discussions in this panel. Um, we will have a panel on a total war, armed forces, and civil resistance in Ukraine. Um, this allows us to zoom in and discuss issues of total defense, how it has developed in Ukraine, and how civil military cooperation evolves, and issues of strategy, operations, and tactics. We will have time for questions um, uh, towards the end of the panel, and then afterwards we can continue our discussions over lunch, and I hope we will have a lot to discuss. Um, I will introduce the speakers as we go, um, but um, we will have Anatoly Pavlikovsky, Tobias Sete, Pali Idstebe, and Tour Bukwal presenting in the panel. And first is Anatoly Pavlikovsky, Brigadier General, Head of the Center for Military and Strategic Studies at the National Defense University of Ukraine. You have already heard him. Uh, just let me remind you that he holds a PhD in military science and uh, he has extensive um, um, service uh, experience, combat experience, and also research experience. So please welcome uh, Anatoly Pavlikovsky. Thank you. Шановні присутні, Dear attendees, перед тим, як розпочати свій виступ, я хочу на next slide, next, звернути увагу на те, чим займається Центр воєнно-стратегічних досліджень і з якими напрямками він проводить дослідження, наведено на екрані. Before I start my speech, I would like you uh, to uh, look at the screen because uh, here are the uh, directions of uh, the uh, and the areas of the research that our Center of Military and Strategic Studies deal with. Теперь безпосередньо перехожу до теми виступу. Next slide. Рух України до всеохоплюючої оборони розпочався у 2014 році з початком агресії Російської Федерації проти України, окупації Криму та окремих районів Донецької та Луганської областей. And uh, now I'm going to actually start my speech. So the uh, Ukrainian path, the Ukrainian way to the total defense uh, started in 2014 when uh, there was the beginning of Russian aggression, the annexation of uh, Crimea and the temporary occupation of certain regions of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk oblasts. Гібридна війна Російської Федерації з використання військових інструментів підтримки збройного конфлікту низької інтенсивності у поєднанні з невійськовими інструментами викликали необхідність кардинальної зміни державної політики України у сферах національної безпеки України. Uh, why did we have to uh, move uh, as for our state policy and our state strategy as for security and defense? That is uh, because of the hybrid warfare of Russian Federation that was combined uh, with the uh, armed conflict of low intensity and uh, at the same time uh, it was combined with the military instruments of uh, combat actions. Відповіддю України стало прийняття у 2016 році концепції розвитку сектору безпеки та оборони України. So that's why as a response in 2016 Ukraine adopted the concept of the sector security and defense development. Next slide. В ході реалізації концепції відбувся інституційний перехід від воєнної організації держави до нової концепції забезпечення національної безпеки, сектору безпеки та оборони. 
while this uh, concept uh, was realized, uh, there was a certain institutional transition from the military organization of the state uh, to the new concept, how to ensure the national security, the sector of security and defense. Цей перехід дозволив об'єднати зусилля оборонних та правоохоронних структур, розвідувальних органів, оборонно-промислового комплексу, громадських організацій та громадян задля досягнення цілей не тільки оборони і захисту України від всього спектру загроз національної безпеці з боку Російської Федерації. So, due to this transition, we were able to combine our efforts uh, as for the efforts of uh, the defense uh, structures, law enforcement bodies, intelligence bodies, the defense industry, civil society, and just uh, ordinary civilians in order to achieve the goal, not only as for the defense, but also the protection of Ukraine uh, from all the sectors, all the uh, spectrum of the challenges and threats uh, towards the state. Законом України про національну безпеку у 2018 році були зазначені склад та повноваження суб'єктів сектору безпеки і оборони України. So in uh, 2018 uh, the law was adopted on the national security so the subjects the bodies of the sector of defense and security uh, so the functions and roles were prescribed in that law. Next slide. За результатами оборонного огляду, проведеного у 2019-20 роках, оцінки безпеки у середовищі до 2030 року було встановлено, що агресивна політика Російської Федерації залишається загрозою на довгострокову перспективу для національних інтересів України. Тому концептуальною основою прийнятої стратегії воєнної безпеки України для забезпечення військ збройної агресії було визначено всеохоплюючу оборону. So according to the defense review that was conducted in <coughs> 2019 and 2020, then uh, there was the document as for the uh, assessment of uh, security environment up to the period up to 2030. So it was stated that the aggression from the side of Russian Federation is going to stay uh, the long-term threat to Ukrainian security. That's why uh, there was adopted the strategy of military security of Ukraine in order to counter the armed aggression of uh, Russian Federation towards Ukraine. And uh, the main idea of this uh, concept of the strategy was a total defense. Всеохоплюча оборона України в умовах значної потенційної переваги Російської Федерації представляє собою Застосування всіх форм і способів збройної боротьби, зокрема симетричні дії у всіх доменах збройної боротьби та ефективне використання всього потенціалу країни. So, taking into account uh, the larger military capabilities of Russian Federation, uh, the total defense of Ukraine firstly mean uh, the using of all forms and means of the armed struggle. Uh, mainly asymmetric operations in all the domains of the armed struggle and besides the effective use of all the potential of the state. Упродовж 2019-2021 років були також проведені огляди в інших сферах національної безпеки та прийняті на державному рівні відповідні стратегії. Ухвалено закон про національний спротив, яким передбачено формування та підготовку сил територіальної оборони, руху опору, затверджено план оборони України та важливі програми розвитку озброєння та військової техніки. During the period from 2019 to 2021, they were conducted uh, some other reviews in different spheres of national security and defense, and uh, different strategies were adopted on the national level. 
uh, among them, uh, they were adopted the law on the national resistance. And in that law, it was prescribed that the territorial forces are going to be conducted, uh, created, uh, the preparation of the resistance movement. Then uh, it was approved the plan of defense of Ukraine. And besides, they were approved the different programs of the development of defense industry and the producing of new military equipment and vehicles. З прийняттям цих документів розпочався процес трансформації всієї сфери національної безпеки і оборони, який продовжився вже в умовах повномасштабної агресії Російської Федерації проти України. So the adoption uh, of uh, these documents became the beginning of the transformation of all the sphere of national security and defense of Ukraine. And uh, uh, this development of the sphere continued after the large-scale aggression of Russian Federation to Ukraine. Next slide. В умовах значної військової переваги Російської Федерації Українські сили оборони застосовують асиметричні дії у всіх доменах збройної боротьби. So in the conditions of the larger military capabilities of Russian Federation, Ukrainian forces of defense use the asymmetric operations in all the domains of the armed struggle. Чисельність російських військ протиставлено навченість і мотивованість особового складу. The uh, huge number of uh, military personnel of Armed Federation is countered by the high readiness and well preparedness of the Ukrainian personnel. Кількість збройної військової техніки і боєприпасів, технологічність і точність ураження за рахунок західних технологій та власних розробок. The uh, larger military capabilities uh, in the number of military equipment uh, and vehicles is countered by the higher effectiveness of uh, our military equipment and vehicles, and that became the result of our own research and development and due to the um, sophisticated weapons provided by our partner countries. Перевазі у літаках і ракетному озброєнні, ефективне застосування вітчизняних та наданих партнерами комплексів протиповітряної оборони. And uh, uh, their uh, advantage in the number of uh, uh, combat aircrafts, uh, it is, um, uh, so it is, uh, as from the our side, uh, it is uh, like uh, countered by the high effectiveness of the aircrafts provided by our partner countries and the high effectiveness of the air defense system managed by our uh, troops. Терор українців на окупованих територіях, організований рух опору. The atrocities that Russians provide in the temporarily occupied temporarily is countered by our organized resistance movement. Потужним російським силам на морі протикорабельне озброєння, морські дрони, сили спецоперації. And the powerful uh, sea forces uh, at, at sea of Russian Federation are countered by our powerful anti-ship weaponry and uh, sea drones and special operations forces. Next slide. Для досягнення перемоги України у війні проти Російської Федерації недостатньо лише успіх, успішних дій сил оборони. Потрібно ефективне використання всього потенціалу країни у протиборстві з державою агресором. But uh, in order to achieve the victory of Ukraine uh, towards the Russian Federation, it is not enough just uh, to counter effectively from the military side, but all the society should be combined and all the potential of the country should be used to counter the aggression. Для ведення воєнних дій у збройному конфлікті високої інтенсивності збройні сили необхідно комплектувати військово зобов'язаними оперативного та мобілізаційного резерву. In order to provide the effective combat actions uh, during the armed conflict of the high intensity conflict as it is now, it is necessary to man the armed forces with the reservists and the per personnel that is eligible to the armed service. Край важливо мати ефективну систему військової підготовки громадян. 
it is uh, extremely important to have the effective system of uh, the preparation of civilians, of citizens. Життєво важливою для України були і залишається політична, військова, фінансова і гуманітарна підтримка з боку наших партнерів та міжнародних організацій. And uh, of course, as a vital importance for Ukraine is a uh, wide and comprehensive support of uh, Ukraine from the military side, from the financial side, from uh, the, then the humanitarian assistance from our partners and from the international organizations. Це все те, що допомагає нам вистояти сьогодні у боротьбі з російським агресором іти до нашої перемоги, до встановлення миру і стабільності у Європі. So everything I just mentioned uh, are the factors that really help us to stand against uh, this aggression, to move towards our victory and to move towards the establishment of peace and resilience in Europe. Next slide. Український народ, Збройні сили України вдячні норвезькому народу за вагому військово-технічну допомогу, що надається нашій країні, та за рішення уряду Норвегії щодо фінансування підтримки України на суму більше, ніж 7 мільярдів доларів на наступні 5 років. All the Ukrainian people and the armed forces of Ukraine are really grateful to the people of Norway for the very significant military and technical assistance that is, uh, given, by, uh, that is given to our country by Norway. And uh, we are really grateful for the decision of the government of Norway as for the financial support of Ukraine, uh, in total sum more than $7 billion for five years. Next slide. Концепція всеохоплюючої оборони підтвердила власну життєздатність. Україна вистояла у перші місяці російської агресії та продовжує боротьбу за свою територіальну цілісність та суверенітет. The concept of total defense really proved its sustainability. So Ukraine was able to stand, uh, to stand against the Russian aggression during the beginning of the conflict, and it continues to stand against the Russian aggression and continues fight against Russia. Подальший розвиток всеохоплюючої оборони України має передбачити трансформацію ролі України від реципієнта до донора безпеки. And the further development of the total defense of Ukraine uh, should prescribe the steady and gradual transformation of Ukraine from the country that receives the assistance to the country that ensures peace. Досвід захоплюючої оборони України можливо використати для зміцнення системи європейської безпеки. And the Ukrainian experience in development the total, effect, uh, total defense can be effectively used uh, as an experience for the strengthening of security in Europe. Next slide. Допої закінчив. Дякую за увагу. Next slide. Слава Україні, слава Норвегії. Glory to Ukraine, glory to Norway. Thank you very much, um, Brigadier, for a very interesting presentation on total defense. Now we will go on uh, uh, to zoom in uh, on one of the sides of total defense, the civil military cooperation. And this is the topic of Tobias Sete, who has been a researcher at the Ukraine program at a, a command staff college since the program was established in 2020. He is educated as a historian at the, both the Free and the Humboldt Universities of Berlin and has conducted research on the origins of the Russian-Ukrainian war, Russian information operations in Ukraine and civil military cooperation in Ukraine's defense, in total defense. So on that latter topic, uh, please uh, come up, Tobias and um, share your uh, presentation with us. Hello, good morning everybody from my side as well. Thank you Ingrid for your kind introduction. I will, as you already mentioned, be focusing on one of the aspects that um, 
an important aspect that is part of the total defense uh, approach of Ukraine that Anatoly just um, introduced to us, and it is the civil society. I have titled it the core element. It's part of the title, and I will come back to why this is, uh, I believe, a uh, suitable uh, way to think about civil society in, in Ukraine and its role in the war. So, um, next slide. So, what I will be doing is to focus on three core uh, tendencies in civil society contribution uh, to uh, the defense of Ukraine. And then I will be making some conclusions based on that. And I think that it, when we think about civil society uh, contributions, it's useful to divide it into two um, periods. Two periods that correspond with the most, uh, most dynamic periods of the Russian-Ukrainian war, 2014 and 2015, and 2022 and onwards. So the first tendency among many that we could be talking about, is that the uh, way that civil society has supported the defense of Ukraine over time has developed from support of uh, quite simple and basic necessities, like for example uh, tents to be used in combat situations, combat clothing, food, and gradually to more advanced stuff. Like, for example, drones, a famous example, important example, thermal imagers, night vision equipment. So this is, this is the first tendency. And the second one is that the contributions have become more systemic, more advanced, perhaps, because the civil society actors they have learned over time how they can make their contributions uh, most effectively. So in the beginning, in 2014, when Ukraine was first attacked by Russia, what the civil society did was to, um, as I mentioned, provide with basic equipment that the armed forces of Ukraine at the time was lacking. Um, and it was... Uh, a lot of spontaneity and bottom-up dynamics going on. And an important part of it was that demonstrators, uh, participate, participants at uh, Euromaidan that culminated in the Ukrainian revolution in 2014, those people who had been engaged, they uh, had been engaged in providing... Um, necessities for the demonstrators like um, uh, yeah like food for example other things uh, making uh, like cultural activities um, providing the spirit of what would become the Ukrainian revolution and they transformed their contributions to support the armed forces of Ukraine so they uh, channeled their know-how into new directions. And uh, out of this came a lot of personal networks between civil society actors on the one hand and between civil society actors and Ukrainian soldiers on the other hand. So when Ukraine was attacked again on a much larger scale, as we all know, in 2022, these networks a lot of them were already formed and um, I will take one step back now before we continue and say that um, when I have been conducting interviews with both Ukrainian officers and civil society actors in the context of research, uh, they have described this tendency in different way. And one way is to describe it as one volunteer did as a, a training ground that, of course, they could not know in 2022 or 2023, 
no, in 2014, that Russia would attack on a larger scale some years later. But with the benefit of hindsight, they perceived what they did in 2014 and 2015 as a training ground for what would come. So they were much more ready and much quicker, more agile in 2022 than they would have been uh, if they had not have had this experience already. And the third tendency is that uh, the state gradually has taken on more of a coordinating role over time. And this ties quite well with what Anatoly just told us about incorporation of civil society into state strategies. And this has many, many facets. And one example would be civil military cooperation um, initiatives, uh, lacking a better word, uh, under state control at different levels. And this is quite important because, next slide, last slide, please. This has enabled this civil society support to the armed forces of Ukraine, to the armed resistance for Ukrainian independence, um, territorial sovereignty, it has enabled it to um, that the state can utilize the resources much more effectively, um, but still have some, uh, some saying, more saying over what is going on with the civil society contribution than what was the case when Ukraine was attacked the first time. So in the academic literature on this topic, civil society in Ukraine, um, civil society resistance, uh, there has been a discussion about replacement. So, and one argument that was made after 2014, that was that Ukrainian civil society, by providing critical equipment, necessities for the armed forces of Ukraine was replacing state functions, thereby making the state weaker. Um, but over time, I would argue, and we can see this quite evidently in 2022 and onwards, the civil society has moved more to a complementation role. So that is, that means that uh, although this bottom-up aspect, the agility, network-based, very um, creative ways of working, which Ukrainian civil society has, it is still there, but it has, but the state, state organizations, civilian and military state organizations have more of a saying, more of a coordinating role. They can direct it to a greater extent. That leads me to this last, my very last point. Um, and that is that societal contributions increases the resilience of Ukraine. It's a very obvious point, yeah? But it's, it's very important the way that Ukraine has, has done it. Because this bottom-up aspect that you have, like, for example, an IT engineer who knows uh, how to build software, for example, or some people with organizational skills who are ready to participate, they can actually do this. They can participate with a quite um, low threshold because there is so much room for civil society contributions. And you can be quite sure that if you do it well, it will um, end up being used, actually. So it's a mixture of state coordination and um, civil society contribution. And this is why when uh, President Zelensky called Ukrainian civil society the core element of Ukrainian society, it, it, um, illustrates, it illustrates this um, important facet of the war Ukraine is actually able to mobilize 
whole of its society, most of its society, and civil society contributions to the armed force of Ukraine is an important place, an important role in that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tobias. Um, now, uh, looking um, at total defense, there is also the question of um, what uh, is goes into the military side of that defense and uh, what is, um, is Ukraine uh, defending itself against. So, uh, on topics of Ukrainian and Russian strategy, ways of war, operations and tactics, tactics we will now uh, listen to uh, Pali Idstebø, who is a retired lieutenant colonel from the Norwegian Army in retirement, serving as faculty advisor at the military academy. He holds a PhD in war studies uh, from the University of Glasgow and his uh, research field is on the emergent, uh, emergence and development of military strategy and operational art and Soviet and Russian military operations. Um, Palle has field and staff assignments uh, behind him in Afghanistan, Germany, South Sudan and he also edited the two most recent editions of the Norwegian Joint Operational Doctrine. So please, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation, Palle. Thank you very much, for, and uh, dear guests. Um, my perspective is military strategy uh, to a great extent, and also its interactions with uh, higher level of pol policy and society as at large, uh, and military operations. So I'll try to balance that in, in a bit. Um, uh, usually, people in uniform comes uh, put forward some caveats, and I'll do that too, because I, I must admit I'm quite old f notorious old-fashioned when it comes to um, in my approach to understanding war and warfare. Uh, despite our fascination with, with um, military technology, uh, modern concepts and so on, we should remember it's all about humans killing one another in order to achieve, a polit achieve political objectives. So we'll start there, let me see. As mentioned before, it's, uh, I think it's imperative to note that this war is in its 10th year. And its war had cha changed its character through, through different uh, phases. I'll say the, my point of view is that the first phase was uh, the uh, uh, Russian occupation and annexation of Crimea and establishing the war invading uh, the Donetsk and Luhansk counties. And there's been a lot of ways to explain this. I recall in back in 2014 when it all began, uh, how stunned we were to understand what actually was going on and not going on. And for instance, this term hybrid war uh, popped up very soon, uh, tried to explain what the Russians was uh, doing, how they were operating. Uh, no matter explanations, uh, by the winter of uh, 2015, uh, a trench line had, had uh, settled at front uh, through uh, the counties of Donetsk and, and Luhansk, and a trench war uh, emerged. So. And then the next phase, as I see it, is the uh, trench war from 2015, um, which was kind of an, uh, had a very attritional uh, character. Um, and uh, most notoriously, it uh, disappeared very soon from Western media um, and world in your, and, and, and the, uh, the, the uh, societies in, in the West uh, when some uh, forgo forgot completely that there was actually a, a war going on in, in Europe. And it wasn't until the, uh, the Russian deployments in, uh, in uh, on the Ukrainian border on the, the fall of tw 2021 that uh, this war s s popped up again and, and became a reference point in understanding what was going on. So the next phase is what many people call the war, which is, its own, as I see, it's the third phase. And there was uh, a, a Russian attempt uh, to, to decide the war by a large st strike that failed. And uh, I'm using the, the term strategy of destruction. Um, and um, what we saw here was uh, uh, an attempt by, by the, uh, the Russians uh, to, to, to in invade Rus uh, Ukraine on a, a wide front, as was mentioned, and trying to decide 
uh, the, um, the the war in its on its own terms. What they were uh, still uh, 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 quite a lot of uns uncertainties of the the aim and so on. But for for me, watching it was kind of peculiar because looking upon the force composition of the Russians, uh, the amount of forces they put up compared to what Ukraine had uh, of a standing army and could mobilize, it, it didn't match too well. So I was kind of surprised when I, well, I was not fortunately not the only one that was surprised when actually the invasion uh, went on as it did. And it was quite, and, and it was, um, it didn't take too long to see that the initial Russian strategy failed in a way. So then I'm going back to the some of the old-fashioned stuff, um, and that is the, the uh, duality of strategies of destruction and exhaustion. Um, these are two uh, two generals from the Soviet Union, 1920s, 1930s. Uh, Mikhail Tukhachevsky on, on the left, the proponent of a strategy of destruction, which means to destroy the enemy, preferably in one large uh, operation or one large strike. Uh, and then uh, Alexander Svechin, former Tsarist office, general staff officer that entered into Soviet uh, service in 20, uh, following the, 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 uh, the Russian Civil War, who forwarded uh, or argued for a strategy of exhaustion as the only viable strategy in, in a modern industrialized war. He took up an old <coughs> German discussion on the, um, from, the, from the late 19th century between Hans Delbrück and, and the uh, German general staff and put it into uh, the post-World War I era of modern industrialized people's war. And he more or less argued that it was uh, in, a, in a modern society it's uh, completely uh, impossible to destroy an army by a, an, uh, a strategy of, of destruction. Because the uh, resilience of modern society of modern industrialized great powers, of modern armies, are so large that it's uh, more or less Im impossible to do it. And he um, he uh, also uh, in, uh, he went into the the debate uh, at the time, uh, where, for instance, uh, the um, beginning of a war was no longer what he called the culmination of a strategic intensity, because as we have heard from the previous speakers, a modern industrial society like Ukraine, for instance, could mobilize the economy and military forces and were able to, to both replace troops and regain the initiative if they avoided defeat in, initially. So Svechin then had four practical purposes, discarded uh, a strategy of uh, destruction and uh, of a de de decisive victory in modern war. And these are some of the, the tenants. And his, his main argument is if a strategy of destruction uh, should function, it demands this huge spectacular victory, which appears to be what Russia aimed for uh, when they invaded last, last year. The snag is if you fail to win that way, you are forced over into a war of uh, exhaustion. And then the rest of the society's resources and so the allies, allied resources comes in. in. Industry, military operations are important, but they are more steps towards to achieve the strategic end. But industry, economy, information, other domains, allies not to mention, are then there to build up the capacity to decide the war. And, um, When you then are forced into this war of exhaustion and are not pre pre prepared for it or have an economy to sustain it and so on, you are on, 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 the, on the wrong foot as Germany experienced, for instance, in, in two world wars. So then we end up with uh, um, an, a, a war of, of exhaustion. Russia was enforced in for, uh, to uh, wage a war of exhaustion by uh, their initial defeat in, in subduing uh, Ukraine in the first weeks of the war. When that decision was made, how it was made, nobody knows. This is a very kind of flash uh, map over last year's uh, activities. But um, the Russian, Russians pulled out, 
they move main the most of the forces into the uh, old po occupied parts of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk and declared new ambitions a limited ambition of of uh, occupying those two counties and began their operations there in in uh, in April and have continued ever since with very little progress Ukraine had a series of uh, offensive operations last year uh, and th the strategic and one important strategic fallout of that was that they challenged the initiative, strategic initiative of the war. So it was it became a struggle of to lead the development of this war by the the uh, these offensive, both the um, the Kherson offensive, uh, which was to uh, many ways a uh, an attritional offensive, and the uh, the mobile uh, offensive by by Kupiansk. Uh, that um, they went into to, towards Kopians that forced the Russians to 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 withdraw, and you had other other uh, activities going on also. So these are just uh, a, 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 a snapshot of last year. So uh, to talking about resources, uh, and and again, as I may mention, there are there are two different countries there. What was uh, what Ukraine then can lean upon is that the uh, the West has put their resources behind Ukraine to some extent. Um, and in a war exhaustion, the, uh, it's very much about the uh, bringing the total resources uh, that need to be brought in to, to win the war. And, they, um, and they, the, the challenge then for, 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 for Ukraine's Western uh, supporters is to establish wartime production of weapons and ammunition, as was mentioned, in peacetime societies. Peacetime societies that are constantly targeted by Russian information operations and disinformation, as we have seen and experienced continually. Um, and the foundation for the West winning the 20th century's world wars was laid uh, in the mobilization of Western in in industry and providing the arms with the armies with as much as possible, as fast as possible, in order to, to, uh, to bring, in, bring on, on victory. Something similar is demanded of us in this war, in order to 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 uh, to, to uh, support Ukraine uh, in winning the war. So very much where we are today, um, the war warfare of uh, this year, uh, especially since the beginning of the land phase of the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive, is very much a, a war of attrition which is very much about uh, transforming industrial output into combat power on the ground. And then again, Ukrainian progress is dependent on Western support of weapons and ammunition, especially artillery to made um, uh, some kind of mobile attrition warfare possible on the ground. Russia's economy uh, has been said uh, it's uh, roughly the size of Italy, while Ukraine is supported by two of the world's three largest economies. So technically, the uh, US and the European Union's economy should easily outproduce Russia, even without going to a wartime mobilization. Especially um, if you also can get more, more uh, effect out of sanctions and, and, and other economic and diplomatic and wider political inputs, uh, technically. Um, and then for the war to be won, uh, what was then known as the, previously was known as the arsenal of democracy, must be re-established in order to win it and to reduce the human and societal costs. That's not only for the war to be won, but also for the peace after this war to be secured. And that means, uh, that means it's some kind of a rude awakening for, for us in the West to, uh, to be able to do that. But in order to make military strategy work, it needs resources. So finally, uh, I think I'm in for landing. So w what we've seen and what have been uh, in, uh, been important to observe is how uh, the Ukraine have been Ukrainians have been remarkable able to adapt and utilize the military support they got in effective ways. Uh, example on the uh, kind of uh, establishing a, a joint denial of the uh, the, the Russian Baltic uh, Black Fleet. Uh, to, to function as a naval force beyond launching uh, 
cruise missiles against uh, Ukrainian cities. Uh, and these two, including the, uh, the economic part, is uh, again uh, examples of the specter of activities, uh, operations needed in a war of exhaustion that will demand uh, huge resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paula. Uh, we will now uh, listen to the um, last paper uh, for our presentation for this panel. We will zoom in on uh, a crucial uh, part of uh, the strategy on the Russian side, uh, perhaps, um, uh, on Wagner's role uh, in the war. Tu Bukvold, who will uh, present this paper and uh, presentation, is a senior research fellow at the Norwegian Defence research, research Establishment. He has studied and written extensively on political developments in Russia and Ukraine since the mid-1990s, especially in the areas of defence and security, speaks Russian and Ukrainian, and obtained his PhD from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Um, and in 2019 to 20, he was a visiting research fellow at a Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. So please, uh, Tug, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Iri. So I will, within the total war framework of this panel, I will uh, try to summarize for you how I see the role of Wagner in this war. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, so you have to listen to me. <laughs> and I'm going to make... I'll m uh, mention them up front so you, you hear them, and then I will uh, shortly discuss each one of them as we go along. You could, of course, ask why bring up Wagner now when Prigozhin is shot out of the air and things have changed a lot in that respect. But I think it's still important to, to talk about what Wagner has done uh, and also how this phenomenon may affect especially Russia in the future. So I think there are legacies to the... <coughs> to, uh, to the Wagner phenomenon that may still be of importance for Russia also going forward. But my five, po five points are, first, Wagner was not supposed to be there in this war. That's the first point. The second one is that the disagreements between the regular Russian forces and Wagner were there much before this war. They were actually, you could argue, there from the beginning, when Wagner was uh, formed as a private military company in 2014. The third point is that I think the efficiency of Wagner has tended to be overrated, uh, at least in the more journalistic accounts of, of the war so far. The fourth point is that something like Wagner will continue, especially in Africa, because it's seen as a very successful model by the Russian leadership. Possibly also in Ukraine, we're not quite sure about that. And the fi uh, fifth and probably most important point is that I think what happened this year, and in particular the mutiny that took place in June, may have consequences also for the development of the Russian regime going forward. So I'll go a little bit into that towards the end. But first off, they were not supposed to be there. So why were they not supposed to be there? Two reasons. First, the Russian Ministry of Defense had started some years ago already to, uh, to develop their own alternatives to Wagner, their own private military companies. One, is, one of them is called Redut, which seems to be more like uh, an umbrella organization for a number of other private military company against companies again. But the point is they were developing their own alternative to Wagner and they wanted to test that. So that's one reason, I think, why Wagner was not supposed to be there. The other one is, of course, that everybody in there or most people in the Kremlin expected the Ukraine Ukrainians either to welcome the invasion or not to fight. And as we all know, and as we all probably could have told Putin before, that was totally wrong presumptions on both points. But given that Putin expected this to go very well and very fast, there was actually no need for Wagner. So when it turned out that the Ukrainians did not welcome the Russians and that the Ukrainians actually wanted to fight and they were good at fighting, then there was suddenly an immediate need for more forces on the Russian side and they brought in Wagner among others. On the second point about disagreements with, with the regular military, so 
we know from Russian sources that there was a lot of discussion in Russia already in 2014 in terms of whether Russia should develop something like Wagner or not. And <coughs> at least according to the sources I have seen, one of those against were, uh, was former chief of the general staff in, in Russia, Yuri Boluyevsky. And whether he was the main uh, actor there or not, we don't really know, but their resistance at that time was based exactly on what happened this year, that we should not do this because at some times they will get, uh, this will get out of hand, we'll lose control of them, and they may create a problem for the regime in our own country. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So those who were against in 2014 will probably this year have said a lot of, I said so, I said so, and, and they were right. Um, it seems also from the sources I've seen that Wagner was to some extent the project of the GRU. They were pushed, at least uh, private military companies was the project to some extent of the GRU, so they were pushing this against the resistance from other parts of the Russian armed forces. So it got off to a bad start. Uh, then these forces, to some extent, the regular forces and Wagner fought together in Syria. That was not very happy cooperation either. And um, that was the, the kind of the inheritance that uh, that the Wagner and the regular forces went into this war with. So why <coughs> why did this create even more problems? First, of course, when you have the regular forces and you have something else, and there is a shortage of uh, resources, there will be a fight for resources, and then there will be antagonism because you think that the other guy got more than he should have, and you uh, you should have gotten that instead. So the fight for resources. Uh, expanded the, the conflict between Wagner and the uh, regular military even more. And also it does seem as if Putin had a special trust in Wagner. Probably because he, he must have been very disappointed when the war did not go as at all as he expected last year. And then it's likely that he wanted to keep on Wagner as something to to keep his generals on the toes, so to say. And that's, of course, would never be very popular with the generals themselves. So disagreements from the beginning and, and just getting worse into this coming into this year. On the third point about efficiency, it is, of course, true that Wagner in the end managed to take um, Bakhmut. They had also been important in taking a number of smaller cities in Ukraine before that. But they were never like one, when they finally uh, conquered Bakhmut, they were not like one, f uh, the quality of Wagner was not equal across the force. So you had what was called the Asnovi, or the, the foundation, which were like 5,000 probably, soldiers that had been fighting in Africa, in Syria and other places that were uh, trained fighters and uh, that were probably more efficient than most Russian troops. Uh, at least if you listen to Ukrainian officers and soldiers who fought them at Bakhmut, the you will see repeatedly that the, these Ukrainians said that the, the foundational force of Wagner fought very well. But on top of that you had recently recruited people to Wagner and you had all the prisoners from Russian prisons. And these forces were not really good at all. So the quality of the Wagner forces was always very unequal. Um, it also has also been said, and we don't really know much about this, but it has been said that the problems of rigidity in the regular forces, I mean the, the rules and the inflexibility of the regular forces was less of a problem in Wagner which is easily to imagine because Wagner is a much smaller organization. So probably uh, on that uh, uh, account as well, they were maybe better than the regular forces. But the thing is, if you look about Bakhmut as a cost-benefit thing, they, yes, they in the end took this city, but it doesn't really mean anything. They lost probably, uh, we don't know, but like 20,000 maybe more troops to take the city. So in, t in terms of cost-benefit analysis, it's probably, it, it probably didn't, uh, it wasn't beneficial. So overall, I would say that the things you heard in Norwegian or in uh, generally in international media about Wagner being so much better than the other parts of the Russian war effort, it's probably a little bit overblown. Then in terms of continuation, the fourth point, I think it's true that 
Wagner in Africa or Wagner or something like Wagner in Africa will continue uh, and at least as we have the current regime in Russia ma for many many years because uh, Russia has been able through the use of Wagner and some other private military companies to demonstrate an ability to be a great power for relatively small means because Wagner in, in the Central African Republic, in other parts of Africa, since they have this possibility to, they're not only there to show the Russian flag and to demonstrate Russian uh, influence in other parts of the world, but they're also able to finance that to some extent by uh, entering into deals with local power brokers so they can uh, <coughs> get the resources from the mining industry in Sudan and from, from other sources where uh, it's possible to get uh, significant amounts of money. So this means that Russia can send out this instead of regular troops. They can, to some extent, you may say, live off the ground and still demonstrate the Russian flag and, and demonstrate that Russia is a great power. When you look at some of the documents that have, at least uh, leaked documents, whether you believe them or not, that have come, on, uh, come out about this, it looks like the, the, mo the main motive for the Kremlin in being in Africa in this way and other places is to feel as a great power. It's not like they're going to use that great power uh, status to achieve a lot of other things. It's the point is, seems to me at least, to some extent, to feel like a uh, that it that's important in itself to feel like a great power and that others see you as a great power. Um, but uh, <coughs> there will be a big difference from, from before June in the sense that what's going to uh, uh, the troops or the companies that are going to represent Russia in Africa now will be much more controlled by the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense. So you won't have a second Wagner, I don't think. Uh, actually, what seems to have happened is that Russia wants to continue what uh, Wagner had done in Africa, but they want more control. And they think that instead of crushing the Wagner that was there, or instead of crushing Wagner at all, they have been quite careful in how they have handled the rest of Wagner after Prigozhin died. I think to a large extent because they, wanted to they want to take over what he had created instead of crushing it and build something from anew. And then my final point, and this is probably the most important one, is that, and, and this goes particularly to the mutiny that we had in June. This is that what happened then may have significant precautions for the Russian regime going forward. Why is that? Well, if you, if you remember, and I'm sure that many of you saw videos on, on YouTube of this, when uh, the second in charge of the GRU, Vladimir Alexeyev, and the, uh, and s and the deputy um, defense minister of Russia, Yunus Bekyev Kurov, when then they went to Rostov Nadanu to negotiate with Prigozhin, and you have these uh, negotiations, more or less, you can see it on, <laughs> it's filmed, and they put it on, on the internet. So uh, you can see it, and what happened was that in the end, Prigozhin says to uh, Alexeyev and to Yevkurov, we, we don't want to get rid of Putin. All we want to, uh, ha we want to have uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov. And Alexeyev says, you just come and get them. I mean, that, is, that statement in itself <laughs> is quite amazing. And it says something about the relationship between different parts of the Russian security establishment. So that's important. <coughs> and I think that has created fissures within the Russian uh, security establishment that are there to stay and outlive any kind of private military company. Those fissures are not threatening to the Russian regime itself, I think. So if the war in Ukraine goes quite well for Russia, those fissures won't be a problem. But if, Ukraine, uh, if the war in Ukraine goes very bad for Russia, the worse it it, it goes, the more important will those fissures be for creating the, <coughs> um, the ground for some kind of, if not a palace coup, then at least more uh, opposition to Putin within Russia itself. And the final point, and then I'm going to stop, is that 
In addition to these fissures, of course, what the uh, mutiny in June also showed was that if something is threatening to the Putin regime, it's not automatic that the security structures will be there to, s uh, to defend their president. And we saw that very clearly in June. Uh, that must have scared Putin quite a lot. It's not entirely clear whether they didn't step up for Putin because they wouldn't or because they couldn't, or probably a little bit of both. But it does mean that if there is a second opposition to the significant opposition to the Putin regime, um, he cannot fully count on his security apparatus to save his ass. Thank you. Um, on this uh, second half of the day, we will have uh, two panels. This uh, first panel is about the information front. The chair is uh, Gunnel Hogensen Görv. She's coming all the way from uh, Tromsø, and uh, she's a professor in the critical uh, peace and conflict studies and leader of the Gray Zone Group at uh, that university, Tromsø, that is. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here uh, as chair, uh, Gunnil, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Hard done. Yeah, thank you very much that I uh, am invited to participate even just a little bit in this really exciting conference. And I, I wanted to open, actually, I was thinking about it during the past panel. Uh, we are talking about civil-military cooperation, and, and Clausewitz talked about the fact that the moral factors, the spirit of the people, is, as he says, the precious metal, the real weapon, the finely honed blade of war. In other words, it's the core. And that's what we're going to now. We're going from the civil-military cooperation, uh, the, the broader picture, and taking a look at an aspect where the civilian domain plays an enormous role. We're going into the information front. It crosses, of course, both the civilian and the military domains, but here we see the wide spectrum of activities that can take place. So uh, we have four on our panel uh, today, and we're going to start with uh, Andre. Uh, now let me go, and Andre Dubchak. Um, he's a Ukrainian photographer, videographer, photojournalist, and war correspondent. And he's, by the way, coming to us digitality. Digital digitally. Um, he is also the founder and director of the independent reporting media outlet Donbass Frontier. And because he's there, I just found out googling him, he's the same height and weight that I am. So here you have sort of like Andre uh, in physical form. Um, but do we have him online now? Because... Okay, thank yep. you. Oh, and can I just say, Everyone has been warned, they get 10 to 12 minutes so that we have enough time for questions. So, please, thank you, Andre. Good uh, day, yeah. uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am a reporter, uh, founder of the Donbass Trump Media. Uh, we have Ukrainian partners in this part, and it's present on Instagram. So, if you will check, find our media. Uh, my media, it was like weeks before invasion because I, I uh, found it in uh, 2020 and in 2021 uh, our team was almost online because it was no interest uh, to the previous like uh, conflict uh, period, uh, not only from international audiences and uh, even Ukrainian audiences will be no was not interested in this subject. Yeah, uh, but of course after that uh, it was uh, invasion and uh, honestly I saw a lot uh, and work a lot for now and uh, my team is like twelve people and uh, just last year I passed uh, uh, more than one hundred thousand kilometers. Uh, most of this like distances near the front line. Uh, and I saw a lot. Yeah, it's like reporting, uh, text, uh, photo, video, and uh, short stories. Uh, for now, honestly, we have dark period of the uh, information war. Yeah, because interest 
uh, from international audiences and from Ukrainian audiences uh, very low. People are tired from uh, war. People are tired from picture and video about like bodies, about deaths, about wounded guys, about situation. Uh, no, but anyway, we will work and uh, but it will be really big challenge for us uh, to cover the situation in such like uh, dark gray information zone. Yeah. Uh, what can I also say? Uh, uh, access to the front line is probably one of the most difficult uh, question for Ukrainian and for international media. Uh, to get access, you need to go to, to have accreditation from Ministry of Defense. Uh, and even if you will have accreditation, it's not so easy to get access to the front line uh, for security reason, for bureaucracy, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, now we have new Minister of Defense, uh, Umero, and he changed the staff who responsible for access to the front line and for information war. Uh, so I think uh, will be some changes, but I don't know if it will be good or, or bad changes for all reporters who work near the front line. Uh, hmm. uh, but also a big question for me is like propaganda, yeah? because uh, we have Ukrainian government uh, TV uh, marathon, uh, like, and it's like every day uh, news and talk show and uh, uh, it's on the main central TV. And uh, honestly, it's like part of the propaganda, of the government propaganda. Yeah? Uh, propaganda is not good, it's not bad, it's just uh, one of the instruments of the government uh, to manage the uh, society during the period of the war. Yeah, But it's completely, of course, different than uh, true reporting and uh, the independence media. Um, but uh, for now, the situation uh, on the field, like real situation and uh, the news on the TV, through this like TV marathon, uh, very different. And uh, social opinion, last social opinion show us that people uh, less and less believe in TV marathon and less and less believe in propaganda, yeah. Uh, it's also a big challenge for all media, for all independent media. Uh, also interesting situation about the news covering, yeah. People for now tired from the bloody news, from bodies, from ex about no, news about explosion, about like deaths. Uh, and we will try to focus on the long-term uh, projects and research, like about the demography uh, before and after the war, yeah, about the social opinion, uh, about the medical problems, uh, about uh, society situation with psychology and with moods, because honestly, now the Ukrainian society uh, in pre no went to period to go to the period of the depression yeah because uh, long war uh, bad economy no work um, and uh, first year of the war it was like period of the struggling and period of the uh, some big victories like liberation of the uh, Kherson uh, liberation of the Kharkiv region uh, fights near Kiev and liberation the Kiev area. Uh, after that, uh, during this very, very long period of promises of offensive uh, of Ukrainian troops uh, to Tokmak and to, to Mariupol, to Crimea, promises from like uh, propaganda men, yeah, uh, nothing happens and uh, society uh, go to the period of the depression. Uh, no, probably it's like Main messages from me. If if you will have any question, you can ask me. Fantastic. <laughs> um, we have. A, if anyone wants direct questions to Andre, now we still have uh, about five minutes left in his.
presentation period if you want to ask him right now. We will have questions at the end as well. But is there anyone who has anything? Uh, Tom? What, what is the atmosphere? Thank you. Uh, what is the atmosphere at the front line now uh, as you uh, see it from, from your side? Thank you. Uh, soldiers, of course, are tired. Uh, and uh, a lot of them, like, lost uh, friends, uh, lost a uh, big amount of the units around them. Uh, a lot of people wounded uh, had uh, realized frontline, we can just fight. We can't give up. No, they need to fight, like, Till then, it's not possible to give up for Ukrainians because uh, all promises are signed by blood of their friends, of the best friends, and of the other soldiers from Union. Yeah. Um, situation is done. It's like sometimes it's good, sometimes bad. Sometimes they have a lot of uh, weapon from there, and sometimes they don't have enough shells. Uh, because the uh, activity, you no know, war is very active, yeah, and uh, a lot of munition, of course, like they use, and Russia hit it, and they hit Russian munition, so it's a uh, resources war, and unfortunately, uh, Russia have much more people, it's resources number one, and uh, this weapon is also a big question, we need more, of course, like we need much more. But most of the soldiers, they are tired, exhausted, but they realize they need to fight till the end. Yeah. Or war or like, no, yeah, till the end of the war. Thank you, Andre. Uh, are there any other questions before we go to our next speaker? Well, thank you, questions. So, if, Andre, if you can uh, wait until the, the end as well, or at least uh, after our other presenters have uh, said their piece, because we hopefully will have more questions at that time. Then I would like to uh, welcome Karen Anna Egan and uh, to come and speak. And uh, she is going to be speaking on Russian information uh, confrontations. And she's a PhD fellow at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies and is affili affiliated with the Center for International Security. And she's writing her PhD at the, uh, have I been off the mic all this time? Anyway, sorry about that. She's writing her PhD in poli-sci at the University of Oslo, focusing on Russian information, confrontation, and information operations in the Nordic region. So Karen, uh, please. Yeah. Thank you very much for that introduction um, and thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak uh, with my excellent Ukrainian colleagues and I have to say it's quite humbling to stand here uh, especially after hearing uh, Dubchak's presentation and just realizing you know or not realizing but what we are talking about here in a bit abstract terms is what someone is sitting in a car reporting on as we speak. Um, so thank you uh, again for uh, letting me speak in this panel. Um, and in the few minutes I have, I will focus on the Russian concept of information confrontation, which I think will be a good um, throw a ball that I'm throwing up for the discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, and I will provide some examples uh, and I will end on some thoughts on the uh, implications of Russia's war uh, on Ukraine for Norway in this regard. Uh, and since I'm from the same region as uh, Tour Bukval, uh, I will also not use uh, a presentation. That's a trender thing. Um, so you will have to listen uh, as well. And you can look at the beautiful uh, uh, slide here with the Ukrainian uh, colors, Ukrainian flag colors. So, my colleague in the previous panel, Paul Idstebe, uh, spoke in, uh, about the Russia's, Russia's way of war. And I think it's an important starting point uh, for my brief introduction as well, uh, because Russia's information front in many ways stems from Russian strategic thinking on how modern wars are fought 
and how Russia can gain an advantage and cleverly defeat uh, enemies without using brute force. And the key here is the fact that Moscow already for a long time has considered itself uh, inferior to and in an enduring um, confrontation with the US-led West, which it believes seeks to undermine Russia. And as a result, uh, Russia has, in addition, of course, to investing heavily in military and nuclear capabilities, which forms the backbone, a backbone of Russian uh, power projection, also sought to refine and develop non-military uh, approaches, um, building on historical methods such as active measures, maskirovka, reflexive control, um, and also utilizing the possibilities presented by new technology to efficiently and economically spread Russian, the Russian worldview, but also disinformation on a massive scale. And the Russian concept of information confrontation is more expensive than what we would think of in the West as information warfare and information operations. Um, in Russian thinking, emphasis in place is placed on how to shape and influence the adversary across and using various instruments of power, such as military, diplomatic, economic, cultural, religious, historic, and so on. And these instruments are used in peacetime and in war, and across the peace war spectrum. And this is primarily done through a holistic approach that merges information psychological and information te uh, technological, what we in the West would probably think of as cyber operations or electronic uh, warfare, and it merges these attacks to target the information space uh, of the adversary while also seeking to protect Russia's information space. And uh, the latter we have seen uh, been uh, uh, in focus in Russian thinking for a long time already, and especially after February 24th, we have seen how Russia has clamped down uh, even more and harder on the access to external information. You've shut down Twitter, Facebook, um, uh, civil society also has been um, uh, shut down, and um, it's, it's the aim is to control the information flow at home. And Russia's information confrontation concept, it stipulates roughly four objectives, uh, where one is to disrupt the digital and technological infrastructure of the adversary, and the other three relate to uh, assessing, asserting psychological effects, destabilize the population, affect decision-making processes, and inflict psychological damage uh, on the political and societal systems. These are intertwined, but they speak to the heavy emphasis on psychological effects uh, to expand Russia's power and influence using a broad spectrum of Russian actors. It's not just the intelligence services, but it's also government officials, state-sponsored media, uh, the military uh, and yeah, intelligence services, the paramilitary units, various hacker groups and other third-party affiliations, be it um, agents of influence or um, useful idiots, to uh, use that nice term. Um, and we have seen these activities or objectives play out prior to February 24th and uh, after, of course. And Russia was more successful in its denial and deception operations uh, in Ukraine in 2014, effectively keeping its objectives more or less concealed, maintaining plausible deniability while simultaneously using military signaling and traditional and social media to intimidate NATO and shape narratives about Ukraine. And this sub-threshold strategy was also helped by uh, a European or West Western, Western conflict aversion. After February 24th, many headlines read that you know, Russian, Russia has lost the information war and ultimately it's, it's the conventional forces that matters and conventional military might. And it is true in the sense that Russia initially has been unable to control the narrative about the war, uh, say in the West. Um, 
and it has met formidable Ukrainian cyber and information resistance. However, as we have also seen, Russia is still actively seeking to shape and dissuade, deny and split unity also after February 24th. And in fact, it seems to be heavily relying on the inability of Ukrainians' allies to withstand Russian pressure or it con its continuous support to Ukraine over time, which has also been mentioned um, uh, by quite a few of the speakers already. Um, and in uh, Pavlikovsky's presentation, we also see how the Ukrainian national defense strategy highlights as one of the key pillars information security. And Russia continues to conduct, conduct uh, several cyber attacks on Ukraine and on European targets to disrupt and create uncertainty and fear. It targets critical infrastructure to demoralize the population. It has sought to intimidate and slow down uh, economic and military support to Ukraine by threatening, for example, nuclear escalation. It has also accused European governments of mishandling the economy by prioritizing aid to Ukraine and economic support to its own, over its economic support to its own citizens. And in my own research, I see this both by uh, diplomatic representatives, but also in message, messages by these pro-Russian hacker groups who highlight that this is one of the reasons or saying that, um, at least accusing the, in this case, Norwegian government of uh, prioritizing Ukraine over its own population. Um, Russia has fueled international disinformation campaigns about Swedish Islamophobia to slow down, uh, uh, to sow division between Sweden and Turkey, uh, to delay Sweden's accession to NATO. And the list goes on. These are just some examples in a very large uh, pool of examples. Um, and it is the art of utilizing every possible domain minus open military clash outside Ukraine, um, as it is seemingly still interested in not triggering a war uh, or a military response from US and NATO. Um, and Russia is con has for a long time continuously been testing the boundaries of what our responses will be to sub-threshold activity, and it continues to do so uh, and often using covert action to maintain degrees of plausible deniability. And the Black Sea region has served as an experimental laboratory for Russian power projection for a long time. And what can potentially be used uh, against Norway and other allies are often tested in the Black Sea region first. Uh, the tactics, for example, used in the influence um, information operations during the 2016 U.S. election uh, was initially trialed in places like Georgia and then Ukraine uh, as early as the mid-2000s. And this encompasses the entire spectrum of uh, influence operations. And I think as tensions rise, as Russia loses access uh, as dialogue and cooperations are reduced to a minimum, and as NATO uh, presence increases on Russia's northwestern flank, and this includes uh, the press, uh, inclusion of Finland and hopefully soon Sweden in NATO, we are already seeing uh, more of the Black Sea playbook uh, being used also in our region. And just a short example, since I am aware that I'm running out of time, but I think uh, just to highlight this, is Svalbard and the high north is a good example, the Norwegian archipelago in the Arctic. It's a good indication in this regard, where just Russia just this year has ramped up information confrontation by means of religious historic activity, illegally placing across and sanctifying uh, various uh, Russian settlements on Svalbard. The introduction of military-looking parades uh, to commemorate the Victory Day and the Navy Day in Russia. Disinformation campaigns about um, uh, a secret Pentagon-operated military biolab at Bear Island, which is located between Svalbard and mainland Norway. We all have heard about the biolabs uh, before in the Ukraine setting. It has threatened to withdraw from key bilateral 
agreements in order to avoid and hollow out uh, the ramifications of EU sanctions. It has used spy ships to intimidate Norwegian research vessels just recently. And this is just on top of accusing, already accusing Norway and the US of militarizing Svalbard and the Arctic. Um, and I could, I, like I said, I could say more about this and I will, this is just uh, to uh, throw a bone for the discussion part, but just an end note. Um, I mean, I have focused on Russian thinking and Russian approaches and some of the problematic sides of Russian information, uh, of the Russian information front, but of course, Russia is not almighty, and uh, receivers of Russian information campaigns are not completely helpless. And I think Ukraine is showing the way also in this regard, uh, and as my esteemed colleagues will uh, talk about after me. So I will end my talk here. Thank you very much. Timing. Yes. Fantastic timing, and uh, Karen has given you a lot of ideas for questions to come up. So our next speaker, our third speaker, is Colonel Alexander Peredri, uh, head of the Research Department Center for Military and Strategic Studies, and NDUU, Senior Research Fellow, and he has um, his degree from Central Science and Research Institute of Armed Forces of Ukraine. And he has served in the Engineer Battalion of Mechanized Division Headquarters Headquarters of the Operational Co Command, Headquarters of Land Forces, General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, and Central Science and Research Institute of Armed Forces of Ukraine. There's more to say, but I will leave it at that. And so please, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Panovi, generali, shanovni kolegi, do 24 lutego 2022 roku, Створення системи забезпечення національної системи стійкості для України сприймалося як новий складний проект. Dear generals, officers, colleagues, so before the uh, 24th of uh, February 2022, the creation and the development of the system of national resilience was perceived as quite a complicated process. Але на практиці з'ясувалося, що така система існує, діє. But really, uh, then it uh, became evident that the system has already been existent and uh, it worked. Uh, however, it needs to be developed and improved. Наша здатність протистояти агресору ґрунтується, зокрема, на феноменальній національній єдності українського народу. Our ability to counter the aggressor is based in particular on the phenomenon ability, phenomenon uh, ability to stay united uh, of the Ukrainian people. А єдність, як показало життя, є визначальною ознакою стійкості. Our ability to stay united at, as it was shown by the practice uh, actually is a factor of the national resilience. Сам термін стійкість застосовується у різних царинах. Але для України він набув особливого значення в частині забезпечення національної безпеки. The term resilience by itself can be used in different areas, but in the particular Ukrainian situation, it became even more important and widely used uh, in the sphere of security. Я прошу наступний слайд. Дякую. Next slide. В Україні поняття національної стійкості та національної безпеки нерозривно пов'язані. In Ukraine, uh, these notions of national security and national resilience are very closely tied together. Але на відміну від національної безпеки, яка має більш військову спрямованість, національна стійкість є ширшим поняттям і охоплює протидію загрозам в усіх сферах життєдіяльності. But uh, contrary to uh, the security issue that is mostly limited by uh, being used in military sphere, the notion of national resilience is a much broader term and can include a lot of uh, factors. Важливою особливістю національної стійкості також є те, що до уваги беруться не тільки питання реагування на гібридні загрози та деструктивні впливи. Uh, as for the uh, peculiarity of the national resilience is the fact that it is considered not only the issues how to react on hybrid threats and destructive influences. Але стратегії випередження їх появи, формування в державі та суспільстві стійкого імунітету до цих впливів. 
but uh, the strategies how to preempt uh, the existence of these uh, threats and how to form the immunity to them. За допомогою створення механізму протидії, адаптації та відновлення. Due to creation of the mechanism of counteraction, adaptation and uh, reno renovation. Next slide, please. Як ви бачите, у законодавстві України стійкість є однією з трьох основних засад стратегії національної безпеки. As you can see, in the Ukrainian legislation, the resilience is one of the three main bases of the strategy of national security. Please, next slide. На наступному слайді наведено визначення безпосередньо національної стійкості, яке дається нам Концепцію забезпечення національної стійкості України, що була введена в дію наказом, указом президента України у вересні 2021 року. Uh, here, uh, at this slide, you can see the notion, the term and the definition that was provided by the concept of the, uh, uh, the concept, uh, of, uh, concept of ensuring the national resilience that was uh, put into power by the uh, decree of the president of Ukraine in 2021. Маю підкреслити, що в Україні що о, важливе значення для національної системи стійкості України мають національна єдність суспільства, влади, духовенства силових структур, їх довіра та взаємопідтримка. Uh, it should be noted that uh, it is of particular importance for the national system of resilience of Ukraine uh, the, uh, the, the following factors play this particular importance, uh, such as uh, um, the national unity of society, uh, power, authorities, clergymen like church, law enforcement bodies, the trust to them and their inter-support, support, uh, their support to each other. Сьогодні для України джерелами постійної небезпеки є. Today for Ukraine, as the sources of constant insecurity are. Руйнування та знищення об'єктів критичної інфраструктури. The destruction and demolition of the objects of critical infrastructure. Стихійні лиха. Natural disasters. Аварії на підприємствах та техногенні катастрофи природнього та штучного походження. Different incidents and accidents at the enterprises that can be both man-made and natural. Зокрема, у наслідок ракетних атак, бомбардувань, а також у наслідок дій ворога, який ігнорує загальноприйняті закони війни. Uh, mostly uh, due to the as a result of the missile attacks, shellings and uh, uh, as a result of the actions of the enemy uh, who ignores the laws of humanitarian humanitarian laws and uh, the international law as a whole. Усе зазначене вище може відбуватися як послідовно, так і одночасно, що в умовах війни стало і продовжує бути справжньою шоковою перевіркою національної системи стійкості України. All I have I just mentioned uh, can be in both ways, like simultaneously and uh, subsequently. And uh, for us in the conditions of war, it can be really this uh, shirking, shirking, uh, like shirking check, shirking uh, inspection of our re resilience. Please, next slide. Також в українському законодавстві визначено, що національна система стійкості – це комплекс цілеспрямованих дій, які гарантують збереження безпеки і безперервності функціонування основних сфер життєдіяльності суспільства і держави до, під час і після настання кризової ситуації. So it is prescribed in Ukrainian legislation that the national system of resilience, that is a complex of the deliberated actions that guarantee uh, the security and uh, the sustainability of functioning in the main spheres of society and state before, during and after the crisis situation. Прошу наступний слайд. На цьому слайді наведено принципи, які покладені в основу національної системи стійкості. З метою визначення, наскільки концепція національної стійкості України відповідає вимогам НАТО, я запропоную вам наступний слайд. 
in order to find out in what way the uh, concept of national resilience really meets uh, the NATO requirement, uh, I'd like to propose you to look at uh, uh, this slide. Як видно, базові елементи системи національної стійкості України відповідають базовим вимог стійкості НАТО. Uh, as you can see at the slide, the basic elements of the systems of national resilience, they really meet the, require, the NATO requirements in the sphere. Окрім цього, в концепцію національної стійкості України додано ряд елементів. Besides, we have added uh, the additional elements to the concept. Однією з загальнозначущих складових національної стійкості України також стала здатність протистояти дезінтеграційним впливам. One of the uh, really significantly important components of the national resilience of Ukraine uh, became the ability to counter the process of the disintegration. Укорінення власної громадянської ідентичності як домінуючої над локальними, регіональними, релігійними, етнічними, мовними та іншими протиріччями. Then the development of the whole, like nation level, uh, let's say civil identity that is really higher and that really dominates the local, regional, religious, ethnic, uh, language and other contradictions. Унікального досвіду нами набуто за напрямком захисту об'єктів критичної інфраструктури. We have gained really the unique experience of how to protect the objects of critical infrastructure. Зокрема, у питаннях їх кіберзахисту, а також захисту від засобів вогневого впливу противника. Uh, particularly as for the cyber, uh, cyber defense and defense from the firepower of the enemy. Об'єкти енергопостачання захищено елементами інженерних конструкцій. We have protected the objects of power system. We have protected them with the special engineering installations. Розроблено рекомендації з їх захисту від вражаючих елементів боєприпасів та уламків ракет. We have developed the recommendations of how to protect them from shelling and from the parts of the missiles after they are, they are hit. Переглядаються норми монтажу таких об'єктів, зокрема з урахуванням можливості їх заглиблення в ґрунт. We revise how to assemble these constructions and actually we are trying to find out how can we do that, particularly digging them under the ground. Завдяки вжитим заходам забезпечено стійкість енергетичної системи України. Uh, due to these measures, we, uh, we managed to, to ensure the resilience of the uh, en uh, system of uh, energy supply. Постачання води, функціонування транспорту та об'єктів транспортної інфраструктури. Water supply, the functioning of transport and transport infrastructure. Масовані ракетні удари Росії та відключення електроенергії не дестабілізували роботи банківської системи України. The massive missile attacks from the side of Russia and the power cuts that we experienced, but they didn't destabilize the work of bank system. А енергетичний терор не вплинув на фінансову стабільність. And the terror in the sphere of energy didn't influence the financial stability. З метою посилення здатності системи охорони здоров'я функціонувати в умовах посилених навантажень. In order to strengthen the ability of the healthcare system and its ability to operate during the period of extreme workload. В Україні завершується другий етап трансформації системи екстреної медичної допомоги. Now we are finishing the process of the transformation in Ukraine, the system of emergency healthcare support. Нарощує свої технічні спроможності медицина катастроф. The medicine of catastrophes is, go, is being developed too. Удосконалюється система взаємодії між Міністерством охорони здоров'я та командуванням медичних сил Збройних сил України. And the system of interaction between the command of medical forces and the Ministry of Health Care. So the Integration, the cooperation is being improved now. Це робиться з метою підтримки повного, своєчасного та якісного забезпечення медичними послугами усіх, хто бере участь у відсічі збройної агресії Росії.
it is uh, it is done in order to support the full scale in timely manner and of high quality ensuring and providing the medical support uh, uh, providing the medical support to everyone who participates in the defending of Ukraine особливим на нашу думку у uh, Питання стійкості України є роль релігійного чинника. Uh, then the religious factor is one of the key ones in the issue of counteraction the aggression. У ході повномасштабної агресії Росії Україна активно протидіє спробам використання цього чинника. Uh, during the counteracting the aggression, Ukraine is also uh, Ukraine is also countering the using of this factor in aggression. Цього чинника для легімітизації окупаційної діяльності Російської Федерації та штучного створення протиріч конфліктів і роз'єднання в українському суспільстві. Actually, Russia is trying to use this factor, uh, religious factor, uh, in. Uh, uh, in this artificial creating of uh, uh, controversies, conflicts, and uh, uh, disunite the civil society. Okay, we have managed to maintain the orderliness. So we've managed also to uh, sustain the stability of governing and interoperability. We. Вирішуємо питання екологічної безпеки у ході впливу противника, який не дотримується норм та правил ведення війни. We've also mentioned to solve the issues of ecological environmental security, even in spite of the actions of enemies that doesn't follow the rules of war. Завершуємо план роботу над проєктом плану заходів з реалізації концепції забезпечення стійкості. We are going to finish very soon the plan of how to realize this concept. Займаємося формуванням урядового координаційного органу щодо цих питань. Now forming the special governmental accreditation body as for these issues. Та досліджуємо питання щодо створення державної установи для інформаційно-аналітичного забезпечення функціонування національної системи стійкості. And now we are concerned with the creation of the special governmental body that will deal with all scientific and methodological issues as for the state national resilience in Ukraine. Що до снігу? As for the snow. Нам дуже подобається сніг. We really like it. Особливо, коли в ньому грузнуть російські танки. Especially when Russian tanks can't move because of snow. І стають легкою мішенню для наших засобів, в тому числі засобів, якими ви нам допомогли. Then these tanks, they became very like easy targets for our for our ammunition and including the ammunition that was given to us from you. І ще тому, що в снігу насмерть мерзнуть українські російські солдати. And also because in the freezing weather, when it is snow, Russian soldiers can be actually frozen to death. Тому, якщо можете, поділіться з нами снігом. So if you can, please share with us with your snows too. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more speaker. I'm just going to say, as a, as a person who lives in the north, it's really good to know that our snow is a part of our resilience. So, yes, move to North Norway. That's your ticket. Uh, but we have one more speaker. Uh, we're hearing from Colonel Irina Izhutova, uh, who's going to talk about lessons learned from Ukrainian strategic communication. Uh, she is uh, part of the faculty at the National Defense University of Ukraine. She's interested in strategic communications, media literacy, disinformation, public affairs, information operations, and uh, has connections with the press office of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, and, uh, and yes, with the National Defense University of Re Ukraine. So please, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much for being here. It's not the first time I'm here. And yesterday when we came to Oslo, really, we came to France. Thank you very much for support, uh, for assistance, and for this friendship. Surely, as a part of the National Defense University of Ukraine, I will uh, share our lessons learned and ideas like academics, like scientists. Um, 
I would like to start uh, my presentation by this quote. It's not, it's not mine, but it uh, demonstrates the sense of strategic communications, the, the key elements of strategic communications. It's communication strategy, it's key messages, it's communication channels, and surely target audiences. When we speak about strategic communications, we should remember always all these elements to be successful. Uh, what we faced in February 2022, uh, we needed, if we speak today about resilience, we needed to mobilize the whole country. How to communicate about all these challenges, about all these threats, how to deal with all these threats. So you see a lot of challenges, a lot of problems, how to, to do it, how to communicate, how to tell the story how to mobilize, to inspire people in the country to fight. Uh, as I mentioned in the on the first slide, uh, in the quote, the basic, the basic of any communication is message. I mean narrative, our strategic narrative. Our strategic narrative is encapsulated in our constitution. We are Ukraine is unitary state and everything we do now we do within uh, this strategic narrative and within democratic values and our uh, according to our strategic narrative our key goal is to restore sovereignty within recognized 1991 borders and this narrative is amplified uh, by world leaders by our president by leadership of our country that if russia stops fighting the war ends and if, if ukraine stops fighting we will not exist that's why we just would like to de to protect to defend democratic values and to protect and defend our territory um about some innovations maybe during this period these two years of full-scale invasion of ukraine uh how we established the communication in the very beginning you see the map of ukraine and you see the regions uh, in ukraine oblasts and um, <coughs> it was taken decision that um, the heads of military administrations uh, in different regions of Ukraine, uh, they became public uh, active. And especially it was very important in those regions, in those oblasts which were, under which were temporarily occupied. So if people in the whole country see the head of this region uh, in the internet uh, telling the true story in the region, they will believe that it's okay, it's not completely occupied, it's under control of Ukraine. It was important that these people uh, appeared on the internet and were media active. They told their story about situation as a site in the regions. Uh, as well, our general staff uh, from the very beginning provided uh, situation uh, reports uh, four times a day now we do it twice a day and uh, media active our military our generals our senior military officials they became media active uh, during this period it's also um, provided us support from the public from population um, what about our strategic communications response you know that uh, and uh, told about Russian information operation. They disseminate a lot of narratives about us. They tell the stories that we are fascists, we are Nazis. But look at these faces. This is our response. They are nice people. They were a lot of them were civilians. They have their stories. They we they were. Yesterday, during a round table with Alina, uh, we focused on, it, on that. There were managers, there were IT guys, but look at them. They are not na fascists. And this is our response. We tell a lot of true stories about these people, 
uh, about their way to this war. Why did they took their arms in their hands? Why did uh, they decide to fight? So these pictures are from our uh, military media. Uh, what else? You know these maps. It's also a new story from Ukraine during these two years. Uh, you know Moscow war ship. You know the story about Javelina. You know the legend of Ghost of Kiev. So it's also our strategic communications response to tell through these maps real story and uh, to tell about heroes, heroes in Ukrainian society. Um, and just would like to wrap up. Uh, I tried to be <laughs> as short as possible. Um, when we speak about communication, it's not uh, my formula, it's uh, Aristotle formula. It's very easy, just remember speaker, language and audience and you will be successful. Thank you very much. I'm ready to take your questions. Uh, thank you very much. We have uh, 20 minutes actually, 22 minutes for discussion. Uh, do we have place for the panelists? Do we just stand here? Yeah, can I ask all, f all our panelists? And do we have André again on the screen, I hope? <coughs> I'm We've here. had oh, excellent, fantastic. We've had a lot of really good uh, inputs here from hearing from Andre what it's like on the ground now, which is it crucial for us to understand as this war is ongoing that the situation is changing. And Andre has talked about also elements of distrust, elements of disillusionment and depression because of things being said, part of the information front. Karen has talked to us about what the Russian has been doing and it's a confrontational operations and the way that it's trying to spread information both prior to uh, the escalation of the war in 2022, but also afterwards. Uh, uh, Colonel Alexander, he, he is talking about resilience. And man, is there a lot of stuff we can also learn about the resilience because you've really uh, expanded what we need to know about the, the key elements into resilience. And Irina has, of course, talked to us, how does communication continue on under these really trying circumstances? So now I want to open up the floor to, uh, to all of you who I hope have uh, some questions. Um, and, and comments to our panelists, so come on. Yes, please. Do, yeah, do you need the mic? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> thank you, and thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, my question's to Karen. Uh, in your research, and also how we talk about it, how do we distinguish what you could call Russian psychological operations or, or information operations from just sort of inherent weaknesses or, or narratives that just exist. And some concrete examples, uh, John Mearsheimer's essay, Why Ukraine is the West's Fault. I remember I was presented that narrative in high school and this comes from a Western, a very profiled Western academic from the University of Chicago that I think shaped thinking very broadly. I would argue that this is not the result of Russian influence operation, but rather his sincerely held beliefs. Um, so I guess the question is, how do you sort of distinguish between these things and avoiding saying that, oh, this is because Russia did this, they did this, so this happens, rather than that's just how things are, if that makes sense. I, yeah, I'm, no, yeah. it's a really good question. And I think, you know, I try to be aware of not, you know, putting everything in the Russia has this big plan behind everything that's happening. And I think it's, it's, it's important. It's an important question. And uh, I think it's hard to give, you know, a precise answer because, you know, what I talked about are things that you can see or that we have gained information about, you know, this is something we think Russia is doing and we have plausible reason to think so uh, as well. So, 
you know, many things also happened in the more covert <laughs> and clan clandestine um, uh, area. But so I guess my, my answer would be, of course, Mersheimer, he uh, probably has come to those conclusions on his own uh, during his research and, you know, um, but that doesn't mean that Russia don't benefit from those narratives and doesn't and we've seen it being used in propaganda uh, channels in Russia as well you know oh see here it's not only we who think this we have these western experts who are like internationally renowned who also agree with you know or more aligned with uh, our worldview or how we uh, view the world so sometimes it's not necessarily about Russia producing all of this disinformation or producing all of this information that we uh, receive, uh, but sometimes it's about how do they use what's already out there? Because if it benefits them and if they see like an opening to use it, to uh, then they are likely will. And again, Russia is not almighty and you know doesn't um, isn't able to. Um, you know, isn't behind everything and every narrative, but I think some they do create and disseminate on a massive scale. And I think, you know, uh, a lot of the information are repetitions of narratives they have been uh, pushing for many, many years. But sometimes it can also be just using what's what showed up and happened to be a good um, a good support to what Russia. Uh, uh, um, to uh, the Russian worldview, um, and and it can help, you know, confuse and split unity and sow division. And yeah, it's it's not a very precise answer, but I think it's it's important to keep in mind at least that not everything is uh, Russia's doing. And maybe my uh. colleagues here have um, about Russian narratives. If we speak about Ukraine. They have, uh, according to our uh, scientists, ac according to researchers, maybe maximum 10 narratives against Ukraine. Others are just <coughs> messages within this narrative. Uh, they develop uh, different, uh, completely different narratives uh, about Europe, surely. Um, what is the <coughs> use, what is the source or the ground <coughs> for the development of these narratives? Um, you have some uh, lack of communication in, in some sphere and they see that you will have problems with the need that uh, they develop this topic, they develop this narrative and they disseminate because it will reach the target audience. They know the target audience. I, I follow a lot of their um, sources. How do how do they teach their information experts, information operation experts? What do they teach them? Just go to target audiences, know your target audiences. General rules, but uh, sometimes they succeed because they know very well their target audiences. Alexandre, do you have anything? No. Okay, Andre, do you want to speak to this? Uh, yeah, like Russian narratives is like. A it was very successful before the invasion, but thanks to God, the Ukrainian government stopped pro-Russian uh, TV channels like one and a half or two years before the invasion. And uh, it repaired the situation like completely. And one of the most well-known like Russian narratives about Nazi, yeah, they build uh, a lot of uh, fake uh, disinformation about uh, Nazi in Ukraine and share this like information uh, in Europe, in the United States, and all over the world. And this narrative are still working, yeah, in some countries, yeah, with some peoples. Uh, but, uh, you know, first press, uh, foreign press who came to Ukraine, like, it was like New York Times, like CNN, BBC, and they all tried to found Nazi in Ukraine, like, and uh, I spent, like, a uh, few days in Mariupol with New York Times, uh, team before the invasion and uh, uh, they really want to find uh, the Nazi in Mariupol and unfortunately no. So the Nazi probably exists in Ukraine but the amount of them like uh, the same or less than in the United States or in Europe even. Yeah. Um, so it's one of the examples of the Russian narratives. 
Thanks. I just want to add to this also the the role of people in positions of trust, that is academics, media, and politicians, which we haven't talked a lot about, but you have touched on. Uh, that's like the Mearsheimers and such, that it's part of that democratic space we have to say what we want to say, but can also contribute to these narratives. Then we had a question over here first, and then, uh, yeah, we had, she was over there first, and then, and then we'll go to you and we'll go, yeah. So isn't the saying in Norway, we're not so good uh, when it comes to readiness, but we're very good at acting when, you know, uh, when uh, it hits the fan. I'm not going to use the word before that. Um, um, no, it's, it's a good question. And I think maybe we are, n we're not necessarily as prepared as we should be. I think there are some important processes ongoing, and uh, and it's been a lot of it's been fueled by Russia's brutal invasion in Ukraine, and also lessons learned from 2014 and what we've seen uh, since. Um, I, when it comes to resilience, like societal resilience, I'm not. I'm not too worried, and I say that because you know Russia doesn't have the language access. It doesn't have, you know, the same amount of Russian-speaking um, uh, people. I'm not saying that you know that's necessarily, uh, and it doesn't make you um, uh, a target or should be sus someone to be suspicious of. But there are, you know, differences in in um, in between Norway and uh, Ukraine regarding what Russia can use. Uh, against us, and I think that's important to keep in mind. But um, it's the never-ending issue of having a very uh, silo-based thinking when it comes to how we <laughs> respond and deal with things. So one, and I know it's already being discussed, you know, you need to have some sort of uh, uh, control and command or some, you know, one place where you can draw on lessons from various as, uh, sectors, from various domains, uh, trying to get like the broader picture of what Russia does, because it do, do target, you know, it doesn't target one sector, it targets, targets several, and it can be at the same time, and it can be hard to understand what, what's happening here, uh, what that has to do with what's happening, you know, over here. Um, I know the national security advisor has been uh, one suggestion, which wouldn't be a bad idea because it would be someone who could oversee and, uh, and you know, have that coordinating role. Uh, and I think also when it comes to you know, preparation, like we, we have to understand, and we already know that Russia has been, um, you know, mapping critical infrastructure. They know where all the telecommunication uh, uh, centers are. And these are important nodes uh, that will be the first targets in, uh, in you know, uh, in the event that you do have a conflict escalation. And Norway is vulnerable because we uh, oh. neighbor, we are neighboring, uh, we neighbor Russia. Um, so, how do what do we do if communication nodes are turned off? Like how uh, we don't have the FM radio. Uh, uh, anymore, uh, we, um, yeah, we need to think about these sort of aspects and also uh, work on various scenarios of how we meet different types of attacks and often in combination. And I, I guess there's some war game, war gaming uh, ongoing already. But, um, but the Russian narratives broader, they don't seem to stick that very well uh, in the broader. Norwegian society, but we have target audiences as well that um, that pick up on some of the narratives. So that's a long answer, but I think we have a way to go. But I know like discussions are starting, but and and that's also where I think we have a lot to learn from how Ukraine has dealt with and coordinated um, their response. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Irina or Alexander, Andre, any comments about how Norwegians should prepare? I can add, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know the. Oh, uh, oh, so so after Andre. After okay. Andre, okay. Sorry, go okay. ahead, Andre. Yeah, I know the freedom of press in Norway, one of the best in the world, like number one, as I remember, yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, in this time, it's not only Russia is dangerous, it's like unstable world, like China, Iran, and so on, so on, so on. So uh, you probably need to have something like Ukrainian uh, strategic communication uh, like uh, department 
because it's very important in case of information war and in case of uh, uh, no information. Yeah, like uh, Mr. Klauser know when he was in Mariupol during the uh, Russian attack uh, the city. Yeah, uh, he said and he like fixed it on the camera with without information. Like society like was destroyed completely in a few days. Not with fake, with no information. No information is like very bad and critical situation. And forgot Ukrainian government from first day of the war, like take in hand like information uh, in Ukraine. And uh, thanks to this work, like Ukrainian civil society, like resist and uh, fight with Russia t- till now. Thanks, Alexander. Олександр, yes. я просто дослухав те, що говорив Андрій, бо в мене треба пробачте. Я пропоную перенести питання із космосу і космічного зв'язку сюди на Землю, тому що тут все починається. Uh, I propose to shift uh, to move uh, this issue from somewhere uh, very high from the space and move to the ground because everything starts here. Все починається на Землі із наших дітей, з молоді. Uh, everything uh, starts, everything begins um, uh, from uh, our uh, children, uh, our youth. Будь-який план забезпечення національної стійкості має передбачати роботу з такою категорією населення. Any plan uh, how to elaborate, how to develop the national resilience uh, should um, uh, include, uh, first of all, the work with uh, such uh, age group, such category of population. Відповідаючи на питання Крістін, я кажу, що цим треба займатися вже сьогодні. And uh, again, as, uh, as, uh, if to answer Christian's question, I would say that we should start and we should do it even now, today. Питання надання медичної допомоги і не просто перев'язати палець, а саме допомоги, яку потребує людина, яка пережила руйнацію, якусь катастрофу. Це мають вміти діти і молодь робити. Якщо поруч нема дорослих, їм треба довіряти це, але треба навчити. Це по-перше. For example, we should teach our children and we should trust them. Uh, for example, uh, to render medical first aid, uh, for example, if something happens uh, and for, for them to be able to help themselves and to help pe- people who are next to them, who were, uh, who were wounded or injured, for example. Діти мають і молодь ще трошки розуміти, що той предмет, який вони знайшли десь, uh, є вибухонебезпечним предметом і мають знати, як їм діяти, якщо вони такі знайшли. Then uh, our children, our youth, they should be aware and they should be very careful with uh, uh, all the uh, all the stuff that can possibly explode, that uh, uh, possibly uh, very dangerous. So they should identify uh, if it is dangerous and they should know what to do in case they uh, they have come across it. Важливі елементарні навички виживання. Then uh, they uh, need to be aware and they need to practice uh, the very simple but very effective skills of how to survive. Також необхідно звернути серйозну увагу на питання, пов'язані з евакуацією. Then uh, there are a lot of questions that we should uh, draw our t- attention to is uh, the issues uh, as for the evacuation. На питання, пов'язані із тим, як діяти, якщо зникло енергопостачання, якщо зникла вода. Uh, so what to do in case of uh, power cut, in case we don't have water supply? Українці вже вміють із uh, цим справлятися. Uh, Ukrainian people, uh, they have learned what to do. Але досвід достався тяжко. But that was uh, uh, quite a difficult experience. А вже потім працювати над планами, uh, різноманітними планами громад, районів, областей, уряду, все починається спочатку з землі. Uh, so, uh, we should start from these very basic things. And they, uh, then we need to go up, go up and uh, look broader and work with uh, first with uh, uh, so uh, civilians, separate civilians, ordinary people then with uh, local communities, then with regional communities, then on the governmental level. А уряд має спостерігати, вивчати, допомагати, підтримувати, організовувати, не заважати. Uh, and uh, what should government do is uh, to monitor, uh, help, support, uh, and uh, actually uh, don't create uh, any obstacles at least. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks. We have one more question, and that is to you here. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Oistan Bogen. I'm a correspondent for an affair correspondent with Norwegian National TV. Um, so I've been covering uh, Russia's war against Ukraine since 2014, since the Russians showed up in Crimea, basically. And um, I remember that one of the questions that really struck me at that time was, why on earth don't the Ukrainian have any kind of communication strategy to counter these narratives coming out from the Russians? Um, and um, as, as Paula uh, mentioned earlier, international media lost interest in the Ukrainian war after 2015. I think that was due to a lack of you know, strategic communication coming out of Kyiv, uh, lack of footage coming out from the front line, lack of easy access for journalists to the front lines at that time. Um, but obviously all has changed now when Ukraine has, uh, you know, obviously a solid communications uh, strategy. You have footage coming out every day from what's going on in the battlefield. You have a system sort of that we can get access to the front lines. And you have memes, you have Sarah Ashton Cirillo doing her international stuff on social media. So my question is basically what changed? What made you sort of turn around and do strategic communications as you're doing it now? Was it just uh, the, 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 the war starting in February 2022? Or did you get advice from abroad, for instance? Good question. We have even Alina Farlova here. She was at the beginning of the process uh, as a volunteer. Then she, wa she, she joined the Ministry of Defense. Actually, the process of development of the whole system started in Ukraine in 2014. Um, thanks to our partners, in assistance with our partners, we revised the whole system, the whole country. And we revealed some problems uh, related to strategic communications. The after that, that was signed the roadmap for partnership related to strategic communications between uh, National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine and NATO Secretariat. After that, we integrated. So it's it will be a long lecture <laughs> about <laughs> how the process developed. So uh, before February 2022. We had institutions, we had some terminology, we had some documents, we understood uh, that we needed strategic communications. We tried to implement uh, UK model of strategic communications at the state level. And uh, February 2022, it became trigger. We came to practice. But uh, the system of accreditation, of media accreditation, uh, it was launched uh, in 2014. Because it's international practice, uh, when journalists, when media would like to go to front line, they need to have media accreditation. So it was started, but it was revised uh, last year. It was uh, renewed because uh, during two months, uh, there were issued uh, 25,000 press cuts. So just uh, imagine the number, the, the, the number of these press cuts. It's huge number and huge interest to, to the front line. But and you should um, understand the um, not Ministry of Defense is responsible for accreditation. It's general staff. And uh, it is impossible just to permit all media, all people, all journalists go to the front line. It should come through some security issues. It's normal, it's in the whole world. Mm -hmm. So um, answering your question, we just la uh, last year we started to do it in practice intensively. <laughs> Thank Anyone you. Anyone else can wish I to? Can <laughs> Can yeah. I oh yeah. Comment, can I, can I comment on okay. Uh, let, yeah. As soon as I would mention, yeah. thank you, Irina. Yes, I also I started to deal with strategic communication governmental in 2014, and when it was the first lecture uh, to military, they said to me that communication this is actually physical uh, cables. 
you are not speaking right in right terminology. Now the situation completely changed, and I'm happy. And I think that uh, if speaking about the Mm, uh, some components. This is first, yes, we spent eight, eight years for giving the massive training to all the governmental officials. It was like uh, uh, some kind of schools brought to Ukraine and it's really like a grow up the some kind of uh, um, capabilities inside the government. But there is also one component which is undiscovered here yet. I think that uh, this is uh, why the voice of Ukrainians are so united all over the world. Because this, uh, we have this system now when the government listens very attentively to what Ukrainians wish. And this is why for you, all the usual Ukrainians it's so easy to support the governmental narratives. And sometimes the governmental narratives are taken from the public. And this is how, so this is not like it's like a system managed by the government. Government can't, and government is under the constant critics of many like uh, aspects of strategic communications. But when uh, the government is saying something which is really a will of the nation, the nation is easy to support this. And with Ukrainian uh, like uh, this, like a broad approach of civil society and broad network of civil society, it's easy to do. Thank you. Thanks, and I, I go, okay, very, very short, please. Варто звернути увагу на такий рівень стратегічних комунікацій, як комунікація з нашим президентом, який не покинув Києва, який щодня звертається до нас, дає відповідну інформацію, сповіщає нас про свою роботу і підтримує Збройні Сили. I'd like to draw your attention to one more level of strategic communication. It's actually the level of communication, presidential level. As far as our president, he didn't leave Ukraine, he continued his uh, um, like uh, uh, no, dialogue uh, yes if you can say he, he addressed to, um, to uh, Ukrainian people uh, and uh, uh, every day he has uh, some addresses and uh, communicate with people and we have to keep it at that uh, thank you to everyone for this panel but one thing to remember the vast majority of activity in Norway by Russia is information gathering. And we talked about the narratives from Russia don't stick in the Norwegian society yet. So that's it. Thank you for this panel. Thank you. We have our final panel. And now we're going to talk about uh, the future, uh, not only the future, but also the present, but, uh, but, uh, and the past. <laughs> uh, but uh, the question is, uh, ultimately, uh, in this panel, what about uh, the security architecture in Europe? Uh, to chair this panel, uh, we have uh, Tobias uh, Satter. He's uh, very good uh, colleague at the uh, Ukraine program at the National Defense University College. Um, so, um, uh, forward to this panel, uh, Tobias, and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. I will not take up much time in the beginning here because uh, Tom introduced the, the panel topic uh, well. So I will just present the presenters in uh, due order. And the first presentation we have uh, in this panel is from uh, my colleague uh, Sven Holtzmark at, um, at EFS. Uh, he is a uh, professor of history. He is a um, veteran in studying Eastern European history. He's, uh, interested in uh, Russian-Norwegian relations, the High North, and as an historian, he will give us uh, an historical lens to look at the current war. So, please, Sven, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you so much. Uh, so, thank you, Tobias. and. Uh, even more importantly, thank you, uh, Ukrainian friends, for being here and to you for inviting me to this, to this conference. Uh, what I will try to do 
is, as was suggested, to uh, offer some reflections on what this war is about, what is at stake, and then about its place in European history. And I think that what, uh, some of what I will say will be commonplace to the Ukrainians uh, in the audience because you know what this war is about, you know why you fight, and you know what will be the consequences if you, if you let Russia win. Uh, but those of us who watch this war from the outside, do we fully recognize what this war is about? Do we really recognize its place in European history? Do we fully recognize that this is not just another war? And with an allusion to the heading of this panel, do we really comprehend what this war means to what is called the European security architecture? Not to speak of a stable European security architecture. And by we, I do not mean those people, prominent politicians and public figures among them, unfortunately even here in Norway, uh, that explicitly or implicitly consider Russia's victory in the war as being an outcome we should and need to accept. I mean those among us who that wholeheartedly stand behind Ukraine and are in favor of efforts to support Ukraine's fight against the invader. Um, my answer is that we do not fully understand, because if we did, there would be a different debate. There would be a different language. There would be a debate and a language based on the premise that the existential threat that this war is to Ukraine, it is to the same degree to the rest of Europe. Also, if we fully understood what this war is about, supporting Ukraine would not be seen as only an act of solidarity or talked about merely as giving a helping hand to a suffering neighbor. No, it would be clearly understood as the only rational, deliberate expression of pure self-interest. Uh, this pivotal question that Ukraine's struggle directly impacts on Western security concerns, my feeling is that that tend, tends to be lost in public debates on continued support for the Ukraine war effort. And here we'll take Norway as an example. There is a heated debate here uh, about how much we should spend on defense here in Norway, and reasonably so. Although, to my mind, this Russia presents no threat to NATO territory, that balance may change in the future and we need to be prepared. But I would also argue that to the extent that the purpose of spending on national defense is to deter Russia from future aggression, the first priority should be to support Ukraine now with all available means. Because as long as this war continues, supporting Ukraine is, to say it bluntly, the more urgent task. In other words, as things stand, money spent on supporting Ukraine's war effort is with, without any doubt, to my mind, the most cost-effective way of strengthening also Norway's defense against future Russian aggression. And I just said, with all available means. And in Norway's case, I'm sorry to say, that would, be, that would mean much, much more than we cur currently contribute or are planning to contribute to Ukraine's fight against the aggressor. But unfortunately, there is no heated debate about this. Actually, there is no debate whatsoever about no Norway's support to Ukraine. And, of course, we cannot clearly predict the details, the detailed consequences for Europe and the West of a Russian victory or Ukraine's defeat. But it would mean, uh, to use the expression once more from the headline of the panel, the end for the foreseeable future, 
for any hope of any stable security architecture in Europe. Because we would see the exact opposite. We would see a military and political front line between an entity called the Russian Federation. Whatever that would mean in terms of geography and the rest of Europe. Uh, this, again, would mean, among other things, an arms race that in terms of societal and financial costs would far outpace anything that the West has so far spent on supporting Ukraine. The problem is, as has already been alluded to here, that we struggle intellectually and emotionally to fully comprehend the nature and repercussions of this war. There may be several reasons for this, but one of them as historian has to do with its place in European history. Or rather, this was departure from European history. The fundamental elements, structural elements of Russia's war against Ukraine, starting from 2014, is they are easily summarized. There is a European great power who went to war against a neighboring state for the purpose of territorial expansion. It is a war of conquest a war to conquer new territories. Uh, there may be endless discussions of what is sometimes called the background to Putin's decision to start the aggression against Ukraine in 2014 and then on a larger scale 2022. But that discussion should be completely subordinate to this very simple fact. And this is a fact, it's not an interpretation. Since 2014, Russia has been waging a war of conquest against Ukraine. Of course, they have larger ambitions than that, but it is a war of conquest. Um, and these large ambitions, they have been foretold and detailed by Putin himself several times, and they could be easily summarized. Uh, those la large amb uh, ambitions amount to turning what would be formerly left of the Ukrainian state into an equivalent of Belarus, in effect a Russian dependency. And in the long run, of course, even that illusion of Ukrainian statehood separate from the Russian Federation would disappear. Just as it today is only a matter of time before the illusion of uh, before the illusion of our Belarusian statehood is bound to disappear. And this idea of a great power militarily attacking a neighboring state for, the pur for these pur purposes, territorial conquest, that is simply something that until recently had no place in our thinking about how established great powers operate. Uh, great powers may instigate wars for dubious reasons. They may intervene in other states' internal affairs, but they do not go to wars of permanent territorial conquest. And this leads us to the only available historical parallel in, modern, in more than 100 years of European history. Uh, under Russia's double invasion of Ukraine in 2014, the last time a great power launched a war of conquest in Europe in times of peace. Peace in Europe, at least. That was on September 1st, 1939. That was the day when Germany attacked Poland. We know what followed, but that is not my point. My point is not to suggest that we will see anything resembling the dynamics after September 39. History does not repeat itself like that. My point is to emphasize uh, another uh, point, uh, to emphasize how Russia's actions since 2014 transgress the established order of things. And that, I think, may explain why we struggle to fully comprehend what this war is about and what it means to all of Europe, not only to Ukraine. This is not just one more episode in the history of conflicts between nations. We'll look in vain for clear parallels in the history of Europe since the start of the 20th century, with this one exception, September 1st, 1939. Uh, do you see a 
two minutes from now. Perfect. Uh, there were other wars of aggression and conquest in the interwar period of the last century. Japan's in Asia, Italy's against independent Ethiopia. But even then, and that is 100 years ago, the idea in the liberal democracies that one of the European great powers should go to a war of conquest in Europe, it was really hard to imagine. Or rather, if that were to happen, it would mean the end and the failure and the collapse of the established order in Europe. And that is exactly what happened from September 1939. 100 years ago, and then no wonder. This happens before our eyes, and we do really not understand it because it is too hard to understand. We are simply, we are not accustomed to that idea of great power war of conquest in Europe. Uh, I guess I've used my time actually, so I have to stop there. There are some very good points left, but we can take that afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sven. I believe this is an excellent backdrop to keep in mind when we think about questions for the Q&A, but also for Alina Frolova to continue um, focusing on more contemporary uh, aspects, which Sven, of course, already alluded to. And more than that, Alina, as you uh, know by now, she's... Uh, Everyone already tired. <laughs> they, they already learned who I am. <laughs> In that case, Alina, the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, make a link between this one's words and uh, to mine. We will, sp uh, if we will have a look at the European security, actually the biggest war in Europe started in the Black Sea and in Crimea in 2014. It won't stop, it uh, won't prevent it, the further development of it, and this war should end up in the Black Sea. And I was asked to speak about the future for the Black Sea region in Crimea, and I will concentrate on this, but we'll be ready to answer the broader question if you're interested in. So, uh, why uh, Russia is so freaked about Crimea and the Black Sea? Yeah, there are some kind of rational and non-rational reasons behind, but I think that the rationals were prevailing here when they decided to make this uh, attempt and occupation in 2014. Uh, for Russians, uh, to, to control the Black Sea had uh, like a, some kind of very principal military component. Actually, they created this A2 AD zone for themselves, which was like uh, established fully and completely in, in, uh, in that period in the Black Sea. And for them that was a great success because they can actually cover all their like uh, components of situational awareness of spionage for many other places and spots which were not covered before for them. Uh, they uh, principally got the mer uh, military control over maritime domain and uh, that was not only because of Crimea, but because of the, um, uh, the uh, they also used as the military component the gas shelves, which were uh, which were gas towers, which were like a, um, uh, created by Ukraine, uh, set by Ukraine in the Black Sea, and therefore they almost control all the routes which are were coming to Odessa, and to other ports of Ukraine. They fully occupied the. Um, Azov Sea, and when we say about the Black Sea, I want we to have this region as a one region. This is a Black and Azov Sea, and let's not forget about this, because even with like a stabilizing the Black Sea, but not stabilizing Azov Sea, we will have the same, almost the same situation with constant threat from Russian Federation. So um, they started to control the trade of Ukraine, and Ukraine have one third of its borders, which are maritime borders, and which actually started to be uh, con heavily controlled by Russians. And uh, they created this influence. Uh, they created, first of all, the uh, ability of uh, um, uh, amphibious operations for uh, the other um, um, for the other occupation, which they tried to make in the beginning of 2022. 
Uh, they also blocked the trade substantially in the beginning of this occupation in 2014. Uh, the trade, uh, which was like a very crucial for all the regions, uh, for overall economy of Ukraine, and especially for the regions which have the maritime access, um, they fully cut it, it and uh, within the 2014-2022, we can increase it only to 40% of the uh, uh, volume which was before the war. And, um, uh, and that blockage was not only of the military component, that was like a quite a huge economic component here, because you know that Russia and Ukraine were competing powers for the grain supplies. In, in the market, like a worldwide market. And obviously Russia gained the competitive advantage of this. We see how now Russia within this period after the full scale invasion, they're stealing our grains and they actually transport it uh, uh, through the Black Sea and deliver it and even promise to African countries to give something for free for them to like uh, see the Russia as a trade partner, and this is like an obvious economic reason. There is another very serious economic reason which they were afraid of, and this is the gas layers. The gas layers which Ukraine obtained in the Black Sea, Ukraine and Romania. And uh, so, and in accordance with our evaluation, uh, the uh, volume of gas which is held here, which is kept here in those layers, is sufficient to. Uh, to um, uh, fully cover the request of Ukraine and Europe. So that's obviously, and Ukraine had an intention to develop it, not only to develop it, but we have already few agreements on the table with international companies who should join and invest in the development of these gas uh, layers uh, started on from 2000. 14, 2015, and there were volumes of investments, like a four billions in the on initial stage, and we're speaking about the biggest companies, like American companies, who were ready to come, and that obviously was a threat to economic, in, to the political influence of Russia, which they use as a blackmail of of uh, Europe, and. Um, the, uh, so all these uh, were quite important, and of course the military component of projecting the power to the Mediterranean Sea, to the Baltic Sea, and uh, we know about the uh, how the troops were deployed from the Crimea to Syria afterwards. We know that uh, Russian ambitions about the building up the poor, uh, like a location place in Egypt and so on, and that was all possible only if they control the Crimea and they control the Black Sea transportation, actually. And of course, they were like, uh, in this regard, they were given the sign that they are substantial, uh, pow uh, powerful maritime player, because they control so many seas on this, like uh, on this terrain around the Europe, that they uh, can be uh, very influential. Um, I won't stop on historical importance uh, of uh, Crimea to Russia, because uh, if we come back, for example, to Mongol times, uh, the, the actually the ruler of Russia, Khan, who was controlling Russia, was located in Crimea. It was a Crimea part of the story. And for them to overcome the story, it was like a very important stuff. And of course, uh, they also uh, remember very good about defeat in Crimea war. And for them, it also was uh, like an attempt to overcome the consequences of this Crimea war. And I hope that this war will end up with them with the same results as a Crimea war when they will be prohibited to have a fleet in the Black Sea. Uh, so, uh, well, and let's see at the global context how it happened and when it happened that the uh, full invasion started. So before it, the global powers actually were already absent in the Black Sea. They have no interest and the last uh, non-Black Sea nation uh, ship actually left. It was a French ship. It actually left the Black Sea. I don't remember, December 2022 or January 2020, uh, December 2021 or January um, 2022. That, so the, the all ships left and they actually declared and showed, yes, that uh, Russia can be active there. Uh, NATO states have, uh, in, which are located in the Black Sea has no substantial forces and have no support from other NATO countries with their 
um, clear obligations to act and operate in the Black Sea. And of course, we know about the special position of Turkey and uh, Evgenia will stop on this later. I won't pay attention. Uh, we also understand that all the substantial players has no strategies toward the Black Sea. No NATO, no United States, no United Kingdom, uh, no European Union has no any word about what are their interests in the Black Sea in the region and how this influence, uh, how this region influence on their security. And uh, the interesting situation was that after the full scale uh, scale, scale invasion. Uh, the, no one really believed that Ukraine can change the situation somehow in this region. But Ukraine did, and actually when I'm asked about the results of our counteroffensive, I'm saying that the most impressive results are in the Black Sea because we completely changed the situation. We completely changed the situation with like a absolutely non-conventional or non-usual approach to this. Uh, we, like, uh, we, we tried to... Um, we, we use UAV, which everyone knows. We hit their logistics thanks to our partners and our developers who created Neptune, which we can use for uh, reaching their uh, equipment location. We attack uh, the Crimea bridge with very um, like a subversive approach, let's say, in the beginning. And it has not only the, like, uh, some kind of uh, military uh, influence, but it has a huge moral aspect for moral influence for uh, Russia. Uh, the uh, partisan movement and resilience signs started to be activated in Crimea, and we see it actually. And strategic defeat, as US command, UK commander said, of the uh, Black Sea in the Navy, uh, in, uh, Navy in the Black Sea, Russian Navy in the Black Sea happened. So what we have now, they lost... Uh, actually the possibility of rapid reaction because the relocation of their ships to another Russian ports uh, and ru these Russian ports are not so good, especially in the winter time for keeping and holding such a uh, big uh, volume of the like uh, military operations uh, means that we can play our games in quite active way. And uh, we, of course, uh, restore the um, corridor where the uh, transportation of the grains and not only grains happening. So we have for now on 69, I checked the, with my colleagues from Black Sea um, Research, uh, the, the research journal, the uh, 69 ships uh, already circulate. And, and for you understanding that uh, the transportation or passage of each ship is like a separate military operation, which is conducted by Ukrainians now with support of the Bulgaria and Romania. And this is unprecedented because this was exactly the case when we didn't listen to the uh, recommendation and advices. No one believed in this, uh, including Turkey, including NATO partners. We did it. And sometimes you need to act uh, like you should not to listen for any other. And here actually for our Norwegian colleague is the first situation now uh, history, modern history when we didn't listen for advice. This is the Ukrainian flag in the parliament when we declared the independence. In few days before this, uh, the president of United States uh, like acclaimed it's like a famous speech chicken Kiev where he was saying that you shouldn't go for independence. It's too dangerous. We have a nuclear threat. And this is also demonstrates that at that time, the whole world, including Europe, was afraid that collapse of Soviet Union will lead to uncontrolled uh, nuclear uh, uh, weapons distribution. The same fear we have now. And probably to reevaluate your attitude at that time, understand that it, not all your fears are real, will help you to develop the new strategies, including the strategy in the Black Sea. And I'm very welcome Nordic countries with their great maritime experience to join Ukraine in this like a changing component in the Black Sea. Thank you. Thank you, Alina, for elaborating upon the Black Sea region, the role of uh, Ukraine's non-conventional navy. And now we will hear from Yevgenia again. I'm very happy to welcome you back to us. You will bring in the third major power, arguably, in the Black Sea region, Turkey, which is um, plays a big role there besides 
Ukraine and Russia. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, really happy to be back with you for the second time today. Um, well, the position of Turkey in, in the Black Sea is very interesting and uh, dubious, as some would say, as in many other regions, uh, not only in the Black Sea. But I will try to bring some uh, clarification from what I've seen in my research and also practical experience of working in Ukraine, in Turkey, because I spent uh, four years working in the embassy. So I know a bit of expert discussion and also diplomatic uh, comments generally on what is going on. So the first point, which may not be uh, very obvious for everyone, is that Russia is a threat to Turkey and it is seen as a threat in Turkey. Despite all rhetoric, despite uh, all moves that we see, uh, it's clear in Ankara and uh, it's accepted by many decision makers that uh, Russia still is a threat. Alina mentioned uh, the Crimean War. Uh, we all know the history of uh, Russian Russo Ottoman wars, uh, they are not forgotten. Uh, so in Turkey, there is no illusion about how uh, Russia can be a strategic partner that can be trusted. <clears throat> it's not a credible partner for Turkey. And uh, there is this understanding. But the main but is that uh, Turkey's policy in the Black Sea uh, and Turkey's policy towards Russia and Turkey's policy to towards Ukraine are shaped by many factors that have uh, very little to do with Ukraine, actually. Uh, it has to do with Turkey's relations with NATO partners, it has to do with Turkish domestic politics, it has to do with Turkish economic interests, with Turkish energy dependency on Russia, with Turkey's uh, interests in Syria, in a much wider region going far beyond the borders of the Black Sea. And this is why we see the policy that uh, Turkey is now carrying on. So what are these factors that I mentioned? First, uh, this is a huge crisis of trust with uh, NATO allies. Uh, I hope you can still hear me. Uh, so uh, the uh, distrust and mistrust, which is uh, rooted deep in history of bilateral relations of Turkey with the United States and also NATO partners, but also the recent crisis that we see on different occasions, starting from uh, failed EU accession, going to uh, US support of uh, Syrian Kurds, to Fethullah Gulen issue, to many, many other issues. But this is what prevents Turkey from um, going deeper into cooperation with NATO allies, and this is why Russia is still seen as an important, in a way, counterweight to, to this NATO presence in the Black Sea. Interestingly enough, uh, being a strategic partner, the United States is seen as one of the major threats for uh, Turkey now. Uh, actually, it's number one, it's top in, in all uh, social polls, public opinion polls. When you ask Turks whom they see as, as a, a main threat, this is not Russia, this is the United States. So uh, the way to uh, more uh, constructive engagement with Turkey on Ukraine would be a general improvement of atmosphere in Turkey's relations with the West. There is a lot of anti-Americanism, a lot of whataboutism. So what happens in Ukraine is always welcomed and backed by uh, by the West, but then what happens in uh, Palestine, in Gaza, for example, recent uh, talking points of President Erdogan, this is not viewed by the West uh, in, in the same uh, manner. So this uh, resentment coming from the past and also uh, all these uh, problems that uh, still are have a legacy in these uh, relations with the West. Second, which I mentioned, economic interests, obviously Russian money, Russian tourists, Russian energy resources, which keeps Turkey closer to Russia. And the third is a perception of the Black Sea as a Russian-Turkish condominium in a way, regional ownership approach and uh, Turkish reluctance to see more engagement of non-literal states in the Black Sea. This is how Montreux Convention also helps Turkey to keep non-Black Sea countries away from the uh, Black Sea Basin. And I don't think that we will see any revision of the Montreux Convention in the future. Even now, what we see uh, Turkey's engagement in uh, demining uh, activities, new initiatives, new projects with Romania and Bulgaria that are now being discussed. This is, again, NATO members, but they are Black Sea countries. So, so this is not something 
that we see a breakthrough, uh, even though Turkey has closed the uh, Bosphorus and the Straits to Russian warships not stationed normally in the Black Sea, but this is also something that prevents NATO uh, countries, other NATO countries, uh, from sending their warships uh, to the Black Sea. Another question is, would they have sent these warships? Is there enough leadership? Is there enough of political will to do that? But even were they to do so, then there is uh, this position of Turkey. So very briefly, uh, if I'm to uh, sum up Turkey's interest and Turkey's uh, position on the Black Sea, what Turkey actually wants to see in the Black Sea, that would be a famous, a bit rephrased, but famous uh, phrase from the uh, Cold War period. Uh, Turkey wants to keep NATO out, Russia down, and uh, Black Sea countries in, meaning uh, being involved in this regional ownership approach led uh, by uh, Turkey, led by Turkish initiative. So this is how we see the uh, politics uh, that we are seeing now. On the one hand, Turkey is criticizing the West, at least at the level of rhetoric, uh, Turkey is still engaged in trade with Russia, but Turkey is also helping Ukraine with weapon supplies, with diplomatic support, with closing the straits, uh, even with even though it's only verbal, but still uh, support for Ukraine's NATO membership. This is because Russia is still being seen as a threat to Turkey. So this delicate balancing act, trading with Russia, showing to the NATO country that Turkey has an alternative option uh, somewhere in the Eurasian uh, area. So Turkey is not only a Western country, but also this country with regional, uh, multiple regional identities. And then, of course, back in Ukraine so that it would not fail in this war. Uh, this is uh, something that um, can characterize Turkey's uh, policy best. Now, what we can see uh, in the future, and this is my last point here, what we can expect and what we cannot expect from Turkey, if you ask me. Um, first, as I mentioned, uh, Montreal Convention will be there. Unfortunately, I don't see any possibility to revise even technical requirements and technical details in the Montreal Convention, because this is a no-go for everyone in Turkey, be it military leadership, be it political leadership, uh, Eurasian is even most pro-Euro-Atlantic uh, forces in Turkey. They all see this as uh, part and parcel of Turkey's Black Sea policy. So whatever we can come up with discussing Turkey's constructive role in the Black Sea would be in line with the Montreal Convention, but not somehow trying to revise it or to change some provisions. Uh, second point here is obviously that Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey have a lot to do together, and these efforts should be backed by uh, other NATO allies that can also contribute to the positive dynamics in Turkey's relations with the West. And last point, a lot will depend on uh, broader dynamics in other regional conflicts in Syria and in Turkey's uh, domestic politics. Because what we see now, uh, before elections in Turkey, local but very important elections in 2024, is also playing a bit with this uh, domestic, uh, domestic audience. And very often, unfortunately, this plays very much into Russian hands. So I see continuation of uh, support to Ukraine, but I also see how the fear of vertical escalation by Russia, meaning nuclear disaster or disintegration of Russia or nationalistic Russia in the future, and also horizontal escalation uh, by Russia, meaning expanding of different conflicts into Hamas and Gaza, into Syria, into other regional uh, theaters of war, would still deter Turkey from taking a more active action in providing support to Ukraine. I'll stop here and we can continue in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evgenia. So now we have been hearing um, from Evgenia and also from Alina about some uh, threat possibilities and some uh, details on the security situation in the Black Sea. And now we will hear from uh, another uh, good colleague from our Ukrainian partner institution. Uh, but about Ukraine's options and what we by now perhaps can call its 
main strategic option, main security policy option um, in the future, namely the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So uh, welcome uh, Nina Andrianova. She is a uh, lieutenant col colonel uh, working at the Center for Military and Strategic Studies at uh, the NDUU. And she has uh, written her PhD on um, the transformation of the armed forces uh, and intelligence services in uh, Poland's integration into uh, Euro-Atlantic structures and compared it to, to Ukraine. Um, so, Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the last one, yes? Yes. Oh, <laughs> it's nice to hear. Uh, good afternoon, my dear friends. Uh, it's a big honor for me to be here. I'm very grateful uh, for Norwegian Defense University <laughs> College uh, for inviting and for organizing such a great conference. And today I will speak about the uh, security aspect of Ukraine's integration to NATO. Um, we don't need this slide anymore. Uh, so, uh, on this slide it described how strong uh, now uh, is support of Ukrainian population uh, of Euro-Atlantic integration of Ukraine, of its decision of Euro-Atlantic integration. And as you know, Ukraine has uh, 29 actually years of experience with uh, cooperation with NATO, uh, more than 20 years uh, of NATO status of distinctive partner and since 2020 Ukraine has been a NATO enhanced opportunities partner. Moreover, we doesn't give up hope uh, to becoming a uh, full-fledged NATO member. During the war, <coughs> Ukraine has been implementing democratic reforms and transform its armed forces, rapidly adapting uh, NATO standards uh, used to provide by uh, NATO weapons and equipment and on the battlefield and in addition using this weaponry uh, ukraine effectively destroy russian invaders and they invade machines ukraine people uh, really sincerely uh, grateful to nato member states for their military and political support to ukraine weapons and the military equipment provide to ukraine help us to withstand and defend ourselves but we also need security guarantees we need to be a member nato we need protection of Article 5, and it's difficult to predict how long the war will last and whether uh, Ukraine will be able to withstand the huge Russian army with nuclear capabilities. Uh, how will be uh, Ukraine be able to join NATO and what terms? Uh, given the Russian-Ukrainian war and need for Ukraine to regain the occupied territories. We describe uh, a few uh, oriented scenarios for Ukraine's possible accession to NATO. I the first one uh, for Ukraine is ideal option for, Ukraine, uh, for accession is rapid membership in NATO with the borders of 1991. This military and political decision will uh, radically change the security situation. This scenario is complicated by the fact that not all uh, NATO members uh, agree that uh, Ukraine accession. Also, unwillingness of member states to implement Article 5 and uh, fears of escalation and use of nuclear weapons, uh, which ra Russia blackmails the world with. Uh, the second scenario, uh, membership after the victory. But in this uh, scenario, we describe that uh, Ukraine need uh, official invitation because Ukraine needs uh, guarantees from NATO to accept Ukraine immediately after the war. This invitation doesn't mean immediate uh, membership. Uh, this inviting Ukraine doesn't mean immediate commitment to defend by invoking Article 5. Instead, this invitation will provide uh, strategic certainty to Ukraine to confirm uh, the failure of Russian bias recovery and uh, the Ukrainian expense. It will give uh, the defense forces the spirit and motivation <coughs> to defeat the Russian army. 
Since Ukraine now has a chance uh, to join the alliance after the victory, the question still remains uh, how long the war will last, whether Ukraine will be able to win and what cost. Uh, the third one, uh, membership in NATO after the conclusion of peace treaties. Along the borders, I recognize in these treaties. The this is the most negative scenario for Ukraine and uh, it gave up the territories uh, illegally occupied by Russia, recognize them as Russian and sign a peace treaty with Russia, which uh, contradict Ukraine's uh, strategic goals and its de facto loss of Ukrainian territories. For Russia, this scenario will allow to actually save a face. At the same time, uh, this will not eliminate the threat from Russia in this Euro-Atlantic space, but it will give it time to restore and further implement its vision of the world order. And uh, we also do not ignore the scenario in which Ukraine is denied accession to the alliance. Then our country will be forced to look at uh, al an alternative to NATO in the form of possibility of concluding bilateral or multilateral agreement uh, with real security guarantees. Uh, such an alternative could be sub-regional uh, sub alliances, for example, with Poland and United Kingdom. However, so far no country has been ready to provide us with real security guarantees, including the countries <coughs> Uh, uh, that guarantee us security ad under Budapest Memorandum. It is possible that Ukraine's refusal to join will be interrupted uh, by Russia as a right to add a non, uh, to add another, uh, non enlargement as a permission to destroy the whole country through the effectiveness of nuclear blackmail against NATO. And this could uh, very likely lead uh, to an escalation of the war of in Ukraine. Uh, five, two minutes? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> three, four minutes. Three, four minutes. Okay, uh, actually I wanted uh, to say a few arguments. Uh, because it's obvious uh, why Ukraine needs uh, NATO, but I uh, wanted to uh, to mention uh, why net NATO needs Ukraine, and it's about uh, I found uh, found f uh, ah. there are six arguments: uh, geopolitical importance. Uh, the the second one, uh, the war. This war is not uh, only Ukraine's. As uh, Alina yesterday told us, uh, that uh, actually, <coughs> uh, I stop on the third uh, one that Ukraine will really strengthen the NATO. Uh, the security situation in the Euro-Atlantic area would be more stable if one of the strong, uh, strongest and most experienced European armies will be integrated into NATO. Ukrainian army tested by combat experience represents a strategic potential for NATO and should form the battle-tested core of the European army. It's proven uh, its capability and proves interoperability with the armies uh, of the Alliance member states. Uh, what is important is that Ukraine uh, has valuable practical experience in combating hybrid threats. It has real experience in con conducting hostilities on its territory against an enemy that is significantly, significantly excuse me, outnumbered and outgunned. And uh, to summarize, uh, the best solution to guarantee Ukraine's security and the security of the entire Western civilization of which Ukraine is direct part is to integrate Ukraine into a system of collective defense and security which is NATO. Prior to joining, uh, we must work together to ensure Ukraine's victory as possible, as soon as possible, because it will be a victory not only Ukrainians, it will be a victory uh, for all civilized democratic world. Thank you for attention.
Thank you so much, Nina. So I will open up the floor. I have some questions as well, but um, I would rather hear your questions. I think that's more useful. So um, one gentleman over there is uh, very quick, and then we have Stola over here. We can take those two questions just uh, um, after each other, and then we will uh, have the panelists to reply, and you can come up here now. Thank you very much. We have Evgenia with us as well. Please. Hello. Can you? Yep. Come by there. All right. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Thanks to Tobias and the speakers. Um, to Nina and possibly other speakers, um, in this context here, we all realize why NATO is important. But how does the EU fit in? Uh, we all know that uh, Ukraine is currently uh, a candidate member. Uh, and um, just how important is uh, becoming an EU member state for Ukraine and how do the two ambitions, NATO and EU, connect? Thank you. Yes, so um, we will just take the second question as well. It's uh, Stolle Ulriksen from the uh, School of the Norwegian Navy. Naval Academy. <laughs> Naval Academy. <laughs> well, uh, thanks to all, uh, all, the, all the speakers. This goes to Evgenia. Uh, you mentioned a lot of the conflicts where Turkey and Russia is meeting each other head on head, and like in, in Syria and Libya. Uh, I want to ask about what is Turkey doing uh, in in the Caucasus, and uh, how does the, the the Turkish support for for Azerbaijan fit into fit into into this picture and uh, well you know we are kind of impatient with Turkey here we want the Swedes to to, to gain memberships in, in NATO we're impatient with the Turks and with the Hungarians but obviously the, the, there's a, there's an opportunity here for for players with ambition to really play out their cards and so what's your take on on, on Turkish policy in, in the in the in the Caucasus thank you so uh, let's take those two questions uh, first, although we have more questions. So um, the first, if I understand correctly, was not directed to any specific. It was about uh, Ukraine and EU membership. Somebody who wants to tackle that one. Maybe Irina will start and okay. I will continue. Uh, it's about importance of uh, EU, yes. Uh, I will uh, answer this question in Ukrainian, so excuse me <laughs> about this. Marina Anatolina will help me. Значення європейської євроатлантичної інтеграції в нас закріплено в Конституції України. So that significance of uh, European integration is prescribed uh, in the Ukrainian legislation and constitution. І тому вступ в Європейський Союз також для України є пріоритетом і пріоритетом зовнішньої політики. So that's why uh, this uh, uh, join, uh, joining the uh, uh, European Union is uh, the priority issue of Ukrainian foreign policy. І фінансова гуманітарна допомога і воєнна допомога від Європейського Союзу має надзвичайне значення для українців. And uh, that uh, humanitarian aid, uh, financial support, technical support from, from European Union uh, during the war, it was really of critical importance for Ukrainians. Але моя доповідь була присвячена саме безпековим аспектам інтеграції України і тому для нас важливіше є зараз розв'язання війни і використання п'ятої статті НАТО. But uh, my report was uh, mostly devoted to the security aspects and uh, uh, in particular as for the using of this uh, article number 5 in the, uh, from NATO statute. Ну, мабуть, все. Mm -hmm. And to... Uh, can I, can I add? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, so the EU, uh, EU, first of all, this is traditionally the biggest um, supporter from financial point of view. If you, uh, if we were evaluating money, yes, aspect, uh, this is the biggest supporter of Ukraine, and it was before war, and it happened almost to be the same. Yeah, now we have a leading United States, but the EU is like a very closing now to 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 this level of support for for Ukraine. It's obviously extremely important uh, uh, partner. The second support among the population of the access into EU is even uh, bigger than NATO. We have more than like a 96 percent, I believe, that of the of the support of population of access in EU. And I think that it's also stipulated by the fact how EU countries accepted our refugees, because we feel now a lot more interconnected on personal level with many nations, and we see ourselves as a part of of this big, uh, big family. And the third aspect, probably that. Un unbelievably, you know, EU was always criticized for its uh, slow path, for slow reactions, and uh, for uh, like a slow thinking. But in the situation which we faced, EU was much faster and much more straightforward than NATO, which we cannot expect, but this is true. And God bless, of course, Ursula von der Leyen and the politicians who can speak like her and who can provide such a support like her. But I think that Ukraine will be much faster in EU on, uh, than in NATO. And it's quite a uh, good perspective. We have a good results like a Today or tomorrow will be announced the uh, uh, next review of the Ukrainian success on this uh, on this access. And for us, this is important, first of all, because we want to have a, a common uh, like access to markets, of course, because uh, we do understand that uh, all the story was the trade with Russia and with many other countries who are uh, like uh, on the side of Russia is closed. Uh, closed for us and for us it's important to keep the trade relations and for us it's important to keep the cultural relations and for us it's important to have these free travels not only for enjoying the life but for many other business components and exchange of experience and as soon as we percept ourselves as the part of you uh, as the part of European family for us it's very natural to be there that's probably the answer Thank you. Alina, Evgenia, do you want to tackle the Turkey question? Uh, yeah, I probably just add two words on EU and NATO and then go into a uh, Turkish question. Uh, I think that uh, my colleagues mentioned uh, the security aspects and then, of course, economic interest that we have, but then we also have the values dimension. And when we talk about the European Union, this is how uh, Ukrainian uh, Maidan's Ukrainian revolution started. If you remember what happened in 2013, 2014, that was Euromaidan because Ukrainians were defending their right for free choice in foreign policy and in domestic policy back then. Uh, Ukrainians were very vocal about Ukraine being part of the European Union, part of Europe. And this detachment from Russia, it actually started with the European Union and Europe as a whole much more than NATO. NATO dimension was added later. Uh, as the social poll shows in February 2023, we have this uh, high uh, skyrocketing number of 82% of Ukrainians supporting NATO. But the level of support to the European Union has been traditionally much higher because this is how Ukrainians see themselves as a democratic, liberal nation. So this is even psychologically, but also ideologically and geopolitically important, not only to be together with NATO as a military and political alliance, but also to be inside the European family, going back to our origin and back to where Ukraine belongs to. And this is obviously Europe. Um, on uh, Turkey issue, uh, one of the things that I didn't mention, so thank you for bringing Caucasus in, is this concept of strategic autonomy of Turkey. So what Ankara wants is uh, obviously some space for its uh, diplomatic and political cloud, for its initiatives, and for uh, living up to expectations of its own population, even to be this regional leader. So the biggest... Uh, uh, in most cases, uh, the, the biggest space for uh, improved cooperation between uh, NATO and Turkey, I see in the Black Sea, because this is where Turkey can be both proactive 
play this leading role when it wants and also uh, actually play a constructive role because back in Azerbaijan in restoring of its territorial integrity uh, is uh, a positive development. It diminishes Russian influence in the region. It helps Azerbaijan restore its borders. Of course, we have to take care about human rights and liberal freedoms and Armenian diaspora, etc., etc. But if we look from the geopolitical standpoint, this is where Turkey's interests are in line with the interests of uh, rules-based world order, right? So this is where we can see Turkey playing a positive role. However, when you talk to Turks, what they would tell you that now with Bayraktar's in Ukraine, everyone praised uh, Turkey's engagement and this support with uh, UAVs and combat UAVs. But when that happened in the uh, Armenian Azerbaijan war in 2020, sanctions were implied on Turkey, imposed, sorry, on Turkey. Uh, Canada stopped providing uh, optics for, uh, for the drones because Turkey is generally seen as a disruptor. So in my view, uh, this can be uh, an example of how we can both anchor Turkey in the West, allow it, let's say, to play the role that it wants, but at the same time being sure that it's constructive. And in this particular case in Caucasus. I think that what happened there also bringing to minimum uh, Russian presence and showing to Armenia, including what Russian uh, colossus on feet of clay is in reality, was very helpful because this is again uh, debunking one of the myths about great Russia, uh, great Russian presence in the Caucasus, etc., etc. So I would see this as, as a positive case for the region. Thank you, Evgenia. So we are able to tackle the big picture questions here. So that's great. That's also what we want. And it's also good that you mention Aromaidan because we haven't been talking a lot about it, but it's very important in, the conte in this context. So uh, Valeri over here, you had one question. Uh, good day for everybody, for everyone. Uh, I'm Kono Hardichuk from the National Defense University of Ukraine, head of one of the research sections fr um, from the Center for Military and Strategic Studies. Uh, it seems to me that it's not fair that Sven has not questioned. That, that's why I want to put my question to Sven. <coughs> he, he spoke about the uh, conceptual basis of the war and the essence of the war. Uh, that uh, So, um, Clausewitz said that the war is uh, the extension of the politics but in other methods and instruments. Um, one of the Soviet leaders said that any problem, every pro problem has its name and surname. In 2014, uh, Ukraine chose Europe and uh, Euro-Atlantic space. Uh, so the, if you speak about the future, so the, the question is, uh, Whose mistake was that? Ukraine's mistake, because several times today was mentioned a Budapest memorandum and in other agreements. Or, in your opinion, whose mistake was that? This war, whose its mistake? And what we should do in the future with the politics? Because soldiers are paid by the, this extension of the politics do, do, to prevent such wars, uh, particularly at least at the in Europe. So you can divide it in two questions. And if it's possible, I know that this panel is uh, uh, the most complicated because the forecasting and future is the most complicated uh, uh, topic. And the next uh, question is to Alina, is about uh, the Black Sea uh, future uh, region, uh, future of the Black Sea region. Uh, in, from your point of view, what scenarios uh, for uh, Black Sea uh, you can see in the future? For example, one of them, from my point of view, it can become uh, a demilitarized zone, Black Sea, for all uh, who has uh, the coastline in the Black Sea. NATO countries, Russia, Ukraine and all. Maybe you uh, can uh, bow it some other scenarios. So thank you. Please. Thank you, Valeri. So Sven first, and then uh, Alina. Uh, well, it's uh, 
as I understand your question, you, uh, you ask about uh, what could possibly be done to prevent what happened in uh, 2022, the large innovation. Uh, of course, we do not know. But I would like just to emphasize one thing. There is a kind of fre frequent misunderstanding that was always happened because of misunderstandings. And that is not true. Wars tend to happen because someone is interested in that war. And that in particular, when we talk about the great wars, the big wars, they do not happen because of misunderstandings. And wars of conquest, that's their nature, they happen because one, someone is interested in achieving new territory, or in this case also subjugating a sovereign nation. So the simple answer is, of course, this war happened because Russia wanted it. And uh, uh, just to one kind of parallel as a historian, I love those parallels, you know. I, I, I said that uh, what happened last year was kind of a 1st September 1939 moment. Uh, what happened in 2014 should be compared to Munich 1938. Uh, with a colleague of mine, we introduced that comparison last year in the Norwegian media and actually People didn't like it so much because to talk about those issues, Munich 38, September 1939, it's heavy stuff. It's really bringing out the big guns, the big historical guns in the discussion. But they are the appropriate parallels to my mind as a historian. And what was Munich 38 about? It was about appeasement. It was about the idea, well, this, this is a simplification, as the historians among you will know, it is a simplification. But it was the idea that, that by appeasing the aggressor, you can prevent the Great War. And, well, let Czechoslovakia bear the cost of that prevention. As you know, it didn't actually work. So, again, well... There is just one person guilty of this, that is Putin, that is Russia. Possibly, if the West had reacted otherwise in 2014 and really recognized what happened then, Crimea is one thing. The invasion, the Russian military invasion of Eastern Ukraine, in particular from August, with regular Russian battalions. That was just a military invasion. No one understood that. So that was Europe's Munich moment, if that is kind of an answer to you. Thank you, Sven. So there was one more question for Alina. Well, the future of the Black Sea region, yes. So uh, the scenario is possible. Demilitarization, I don't believe in this scenario. I believe it's absolutely non-realistic and some kind of, you know, I know many people who dream that the Crimea would be like a just a touristic place, but it's it won't be. Uh, because, uh, yeah, well, the, the life of today shows that neutrality is the false concept. You cannot keep neutrality. You cannot like a, and for Ukraine, let's have a joke. It would be easier to reject the navy because we don't have navy now. But for Turkey, I believe it would be not not a choice to to like a, to take out their fleet somewhere out. And for Romania and Bulgaria who feel the threat, it also would be no choice. And we will still have Russia there, even if we like a manage to uh, take their fleet away from Black Sea, but they will be still there. And we know that Russia always starts aggression again. So I think that demilitarization, unfortunately, this is not a concept which can uh, prevail. Um, or maybe fortunately, because I'm just like a very militarized person and I'm just on opposite position, I consider that the Crimea should be a military base, like as much as possible, and the, uh, for the next future, like uh, some kind of visible period. Of course, we can combine it with tourism and with all the other, because we see, for example, Hawaii, which is one of the biggest um, the, the military base of United States, and at the same time, quite a good resort. We can have the same approach, yes. But to protect our interests, and this is not only only about protection because the Crimea is like a closing up our um, uh, trade routes. It's closing up our other um, our the, the, the actually the bank of the continental Ukraine, let's say so. But it's also uh, uh, 
it also gives the possibility to control the situation all over the Black Sea, to have a situational awareness, to have this like a blockage of projection of power from Russia, and to have a control over Russia behavior in some way. So I think that uh, this is the most, uh, and uh, actually I see only two scenarios. Uh, one scenario that uh, the influence of Turkey will still be uh, like a, so big that we can normally operate only with the um, unification of the f uh, forces and efforts of Black Sea nations when we like uh, see this as the component of uh, uh, NATO Black Sea nations plus Ukraine uh, hope that it will all be the NATO Black Sea nations in the soon so but uh, mainly like uh, only literal state cooperation and only literal state uh, uh, control over the situation the best variant if uh, that we can have like a free access of the other NATO non non Black Sea nations and therefore uh, the Black Sea beca will become as a Baltic the NATO sea because we can then be absolutely sure in the like a decreasing of influence these all two scenarios which I see and we have as an expert community we have developed the recommendations for the government how we can now make a steps towards this there, uh, still in this even in this situation we have opportunities to do something and to uh, make the situation better one of these recommendations already applied about the uh, support of convoy of the ships with the mining uh, facilities of our uh, literal states but there are a lot of many other options which can be done even now to stabilize the situation. That's my vision. Okay, thank you. So we have no more questions from the audience, but I think it's, it could be suitable to end this panel and also uh, the main part of our program today. We will have closing spe uh, speech, of course, as well. But this panel with uh, going back to history a little bit. So uh, referring, referring to your introduction, Sven, in, in a way, so it's, it's dangerous to try to uh, paraphrase what somebody has been saying in uh, one sentence, but, <laughs> but I will try. <laughs> and in, in one sentence, I believe your argument is that uh, we have a war going on, but the nature of it is unrecognized or at least underappreciated. Yep. So then the question becomes, what what are the implications of that yeah? yeah what what do we have to take into account and how do policies have to be changed in order to fit the uh, policies into the nature of to the nature of the war yeah uh, well the poly my, i think at least that uh, the policy implications for a country like norway Unfortunately, the Minister of Foreign Affairs is not here. Um, uh, it would be enormous to, if we recognized what this war is really about, if we recognized what is at stake. As you all know, uh, Norway adopted last year, or was it earlier this year, earlier this year actually, a so-called Nansen program, 75 billion kroner divided over five years, 15 billion kroner uh, a year, Last year, according to official Norwegian figures, uh, Norway transport, uh, transferred to Ukraine support valued at 12 billion kroner. And uh, for you, maybe not all of you in the Ukraine audience will be aware of this. That amount equals the surplus income to Norway over three and a half days in 2022 because of the extremely high energy prices. Norway's surplus income last year, because if we compare to the deflation from 2021 to what actually happened in 2022, was close to 1,000 billion kroner. Our support the same year was 12 billion kroner, and we are proud of it. There is nothing to be proud of. So, so, I mean, uh, we discuss the size of the defense budget, but we don't discuss the size of support for Ukraine because we are so extremely happy by that nonsense program. And my only uh, kind of explanation is that we don't understand. 
if we did, we would understand that, and that is my opinion. There could be people here that would disagree. Actually, if you want to strengthen Norway's real defenses for the future against Russian aggression, we should support Ukraine. That would be, frankly speaking, the most effective way to, to support the war. So in Norway, we do have the means, but we don't have the will. We hesitate, we have no resolve. And my own explanation is the lack of comprehension of what this war is about. So if anyone could just tell the po uh, policymakers, I would be so pleased. Okay, so um, thank you Sven. Thank you Nina, Alina and Evgenia who participated digitally. And now I will give the floor to Tom who will introduce the closing speaker. Thank you, uh, Tobias. Um, our lo uh, last uh, speaker, uh, the closing speech, it's uh, by my dear friend uh, Volodymyr Milenko, is the director uh, at the Ministry of Defense in Ukraine. Uh, he uh, is responsible for all uh, military education. And he has a PhD as well on uh, some very technical issues. But uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please come, uh, Mirko. Thank you for this presentation of me as the director of the department. Thank you, my dear friend. Dear Mr. General. Dear Mr. Uh, dear officers, colleagues, and those who are here, participants. Хочу висловити слова подяки за надану можливість взяти безпосередню участь у цій науковій конференції. I would like to express my gratitude to be able to take part, a direct part in this conference here. У зустрічі науковців та практиків, партнерів і однодумців, з якими ми поділяємо європейські цінності та реалізуємо перспективні проекти у сфері військової освіти і науки. Аналізуємо проблематику глобальних безпекових загроз, світопорядку та міжнародного права. And this is a gathering for scientists and practitioners, our partners and like-minded people. We share the same European values with you. We implement same promising projects to the, together in the area of military education and science. We analyze the issues of global security aspects and threats to the world and international law. Висловлюю вдячність всьому народу королівства Норвегії за підтримку України в протистоянні неспровокованій збройній агресії Російської Федерації. And on behalf of the leaders of Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, I would like to express my gratitude to all the people of Norway who are supporting Ukraine in, in resisting in this unprovoked armed aggression from the Russian Federation. Саме ви з перших днів широкомасштабного російського вторгнення підтримуєте нашу державу гуманітарними ініціативами, військово-технічними засобами та екіпіруванням для наших захисників. Виділяєте значні кошти на реалізацію військової навчальної місії Європейського Союзу. From the first days of the large scale invasion, you are the ones that are supporting us all the time, our country, with different humanitarian initiatives, with military technical means and equipment for our defenders. You provide significant, significant resources and funds to implement military training missions of the European Union. And this contribution is priceless to the battle our people are fighting for freedom and independence. Тільки спільними, скоординованими зусиллями ми спроможні день у день відбивати наступ противника. Only with joint coordinated forces we are able to fight the enemy. It's offensive every single day. Конференція досягла основної мети. 
the conference reached its main goal. Ми зібрали разом науковців, практиків, виконавців та законодавців у сфері безпеки та оборони для обміну набутим досвідом. We gathered together scientists, practitioners, implementers and legislators in the area of security and defense to exchange our experience. Я хотів би віддати належне організаторам конференції, адже все відбулося блискуче. Захід став майданчиком для цілеспрямованого та конструктивного діалогу, важливих виступів і запитань. And I would also like to say uh, thank the organizers of this event because everything was done brilliantly. Uh, this event became a platform for meaningful and constructive dialogue, important speeches and questions. Вважаю, що ця конференція дозволила зробити внесок не тільки в загальнонаціональне, а й міжнародне академічне середовище. І є свідченням того, що військові навчальні заклади, наукові установи, як України, так і Норвегії, долучаться до процесу розбудови стійкості своїх держав. And I believe that this conference made it possible to contribute not only to the national but also international academic environment and is an evidence that military educational institutions of Ukraine and Norway are deeply involved in the process of building resilience in our countries. Thank you, uh, Volodymyr, and uh, I will not uh, keep you uh, longer. I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, it seems like we have to apprehend the situation that we are in, in Europe, in Norway. And as Alina has said, uh, we have to set uh, goals. What do we want to attain in this war? from Norway side as well, and then follow up with policy um, and support. And then uh, we also find that we learn and can learn a lot from the Ukrainians in this war. That can benefit the Ukrainians if we systemize it and, pro and research on it and provide it back. It can also secure European states and Norway far better. But I want to use the opportunity to thank uh, some people because we have uh, had uh, a lot of moving parts in a conference like this. Uh, I can't mention everybody, but I want to thank uh, the people that, that come, uh, that came, uh, and uh, especially the ones that came from afar, our Ukrainian partners. We will continue to work together uh, this week uh, on on uh, issues um, and that are something that we're looking forward to. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, the interpreters. I know this is a hard work. The technicians uh, in the back, uh, the conference team, uh, uh, the presenters and the chairs. And uh, I just want to mention a couple of people. Uh, we have uh, Tobias in, uh, in the Ukraine program. We have uh, Lina who has been supporting us. We have Gade. Um, of course, uh, the, the leadership of the, of the National Defense University. Uh, but I want to mention especially Trude on the far end here. Can you please just uh, stand up? Uh, because you've been <laughs> exceptional. Without Trude, this conference will not uh, have taken place, that's for sure. So, uh, thank you all for coming, and I wish you uh, a good evening. And uh, to uh, Ukrainians, and uh, Slava Ukraini.